you need quite a large budget to send people at a moment's notice around the world to investigate breaking cases. Uh, you know, I'd say set something up in a place where, you know, you, you have a better odds on chance of capturing something. So that that's, you know, <laughs> anything short of that, I'm really not sure. Speaking of things that aren't drastic, we're getting kind of a trickle effect of news about possible life in outer space. And that's a bad pun, except that there appears to be flowing water on Mars, but not the kind you want to drink. No, evidently not. I haven't dove into that yet. I've uh, I've heard rumblings of it over the past couple of days, but I, I haven't really had the time to dive into it and find out what it's all about. Why don't you give us your thumbnail? Well, the thumbnail is, according to a story I have here from The Guardian, liquid water runs down canyons and crater walls over the summer months on Mars, according to researchers who say the discovery raises the chances of being home to some form of life. The trickles leave long, dark stains on the Martian terrain that could reach hundreds of meters downhill in the warmer months before they dry up in the autumn as surface temperatures drop. Now, one more thing here. Scientists are unsure where the water comes from, but it may rise up from the underground ice or salty aquifers or condense out of the thin Martian atmosphere. Now, interesting here is that the water coming from the subsurface. And you wonder here, if Martians truly existed and the surface atmosphere is dying over millennia, would they retreat to the interior of the planet to keep some kind of ecosystem going? Sure, in a good science fiction novel. <laughs> well, of course. But the thing here is, if there's life, what they're telling you is that life is microbial. You know, it's not Martians. Although, what is it, this new movie with Matt Damon, The Martian, where he is an explorer who is stranded on Mars, and he grows potatoes there. That's one of the shticks they pull. But the point being here is we're getting this gradual flow. Again, there's a pun. I'm sorry, folks. The gradual flow of information indicating the conditions for life are present on other worlds. And again, we get back to, are we talking about gradual disclosure here? Mm, I don't think so, but if it is some form of gradual disclosure, it wouldn't surprise me. Obviously, the big question here is, what would work better? Would it work better to say, okay, we know there's life in the universe, maybe we're in contact with them, assuming UFOs are spaceships, and that's a big if and a big assumption. Would that cause panic or a serious impact to the stock market and the energy industries and all no, that? No. Or would it be better to just feed the information in so slowly, so gradually over a period of several decades that we wake up and we're used to it? You know, we are accustomed to the fact that there's water on Mars and it's flowing. There's water on some of the moons of what, Jupiter and Saturn, and that we're getting closer and closer to discovering the possible presence of planets around other star systems that are in the so-called Goldilocks zone. So we have so many sources of possible life. Wouldn't it make sense that over a period of billions of years, real civilizations have arisen? But if we accept that, unless there's some really bad news, like we've got evil locusts from outer space attacking us, like in Independence Day, wouldn't that be the best way to convey the message? Of course, it requires a plan that can be carried out over several decades. You know, I don't think that Orson Welles syndrome uh, argument works anymore. I think people are are more than ready uh, to, to hear the truth if the truth has not been uh, told yet. So I, I, I disagree with anyone who says that it's going to topple, uh, you know, the financial uh, – centers and you know might might do a number on the uh, islamic communities because they you know they consider themselves to be the center of the universe so that that might be a problem but i think in the west i i don't i don't see it as being the kind of issue it maybe would have been in the 40s or 50s uh closer to you know world war ii and you know larger you know global conflicts on the planet i, I think i think people are 
pretty jaded, jaded and cynical. And uh, to be honest with you, I think even if they did make an announcement, I bet you there'd be a sizable percentage of people that would think there was some sort of, you know, some sort of ploy by the government and they wouldn't believe it. Well, just consider this. We can get into all sorts of conspiracy theories. People, according to surveys, don't believe the press. They don't believe the government. They believe the president of the United States, who, I mean, you may disagree from all indications, was born in Hawaii in 1961, according to the Hawaiian newspapers at the time, who claims to be a Christian, who goes to a Christian church. And Reverend Wright was a Christian, a holy roller kind of Christian. So we have someone who is evidently a Christian, born in the United States, but was a third of Republicans believe he's a Muslim or not born in the United States? <laughs> I mean, all right, you know, why do we care? And of course, the big argument would be if this guy wasn't half black but white, would we care? And why do we even allow Ted Cruz, who was born in Canada, to run for president? That's a good question. Well, because the definition of natural born citizen means that his mother was a native born American. I think that's the way. But that's the same thing true with Obama. So what difference would it make? Anyway, let's talk about instead of known creatures, unknown creatures. Yeah. There's a new book out from Stan Gordon, who is one of the top crack researchers in Pennsylvania. The book is called Astonishing Encounters, Pennsylvania's Unknown Creatures. Case book three, and what can I say? He's coming up next with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It took hours before it returned, but I'd already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Talk to a sales rep at iWeb.com. Use the promo code TechNightOwl for a special discount. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. Hi, Peter Vaccaro for ParanormalDate.com. Are you looking for love in all the wrong places? Now you have a chance to change that by signing up for free at ParanormalDate.com. This incredible dating site puts people of like minds together. People who are interested in the strange, the unusual, mysteries, ghosts, UFOs, and the afterlife, and so much more. ParanormalDate.com was developed for you, people seeking a viable alternative to the other dating services. You can join for free by going to ParanormalDate.com, and if you decide you like it and want to connect with people, use the code GEORGE for a substantial discount. Mark Rawlings, president of ParanormalDate.com, says so many people hunger to share their experiences about the paranormal, the unexplainable, or the afterlife, and so much more, and this is the source for them to meet and share that common interest. So sign up for free at ParanormalDate.com, ParanormalDate.com and use the code GEORGE if you decide to connect with someone you like. There are hundreds of silver products on the market today, but there's nothing like the astonishing health benefits of the multi-patented One Silver Solution. Boost your immune system at a great price with our Silver Solution Liquid, starting at $12.95 a bottle, now available in regular and extra strength. That's half the price of the leading competitors. Call 844-USE-SILVER for your free catalog or go to OneSilverSolution.com. OneSilverSolution.com. There is only one Silver Solution. Sciatica, lower back pain, hip pain, poor posture. If you suffer from any of these problems, get ready to relax. Introducing an amazing product that's been in the market for over 25 years, the Sacro Wedgie. It was invented by a football coach using a common sense osteopath technique. He created this device to help his athletes by isolating and supporting the sacrum, which is the keystone of our anatomy. This wedge-shaped bone is in the center of our hips, where a lot of pain starts. Simply relax 20 minutes daily on the amazingly simple Sacro Wedgie and let 
gravity do the work, helping muscles rebalance and start releasing nerves. Sit in the sacral wedgie at the computer or while traveling to help correct posture to finally help relieve those stubborn aches and pains for only $33.95. It's made in the USA, so click the family-owned website at sacrowedgie.com, spelled S-A-C-R-O-W-E-D-G-Y.com, or call 1-800-737-9295. That's 1-800-737-9295. Relax your back pain away with the Sacro Wedgie. Owe $10,000 or more to the IRS? Get on board with the tax admiral. Don't pick on the IRS alone. I'll cut penalties and reduce your overall tax bill. Sometimes I can even get it zeroed out completely. We're an A-rated company helping people clean up their mess with the IRS. If you owe $10,000 or more, then call the tax admiral. Call 800-287-7180. Again, that's 800-287-7180. 800-287-7180. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. On the Paracast this week, we have Stan Gordon. The book is called Astonishing Encounters, Pennsylvania's Unknown Creatures, Case Book 3. We'll get into that in a moment. I want to tell you something about the offer of a lifetime. We are offering, get this now, lifetime subscriptions for the Paracast Plus. All right? So we have it working now four ways. Monthly subscription is $5 a month. Annual subscription is $50 a year. For a five-year subscription, it's $175. But for $300, lifetime. And right now, the actuarial tables say that I'm going to live until I'm 84. So I'll be around for a while. And Chris will live to 83, I think. So, And he's a lot younger than I am. So we're going to be around. What we offer with the Paracast Plus at plus.theparacast.com is the ad-free version of this show, the After the Paracast podcast, exclusively available to Paracast Plus subscribers. You know, a lot of good stuff going on there. Now, with a lifetime offer, if you subscribe to Paracast Plus for a year, you get Secrets of the Mysterious Valley, the ebook version from Chris. For five years, you get that book and Stalking the Tricksters. And for lifetime subscriptions, you get both books. And maybe I'll throw in a copy of Attack of the Rockoids, a sci-fi thriller that my son and I wrote. Okay? Plus.theparacast.com. Stan, you've got a wealth of information there. And I have to tell you, I lived in Pennsylvania for about six years, long, long time ago. And I probably made a foolish mistake leaving it. But why do we find so many strange things happening in Pennsylvania? Well, you know, historically, there's been a a long history of phenomena in Pennsylvania, from Native American accounts to many articles that were written uh, in 800s of the newspapers across Pennsylvania. People seeing strange things in the sky and strange things in the woods. So it's been going on for a long time. But also, you've got to remember, you know, I started my hotline back in 1969. And we're probably, I would say, probably the most active scientific-oriented research group probably in the country, even though it was relatively small. We were extremely active. We were out there day and night, 24 hours a day, across the state investigating cases. And it was one of the only places in the country where you could report a sighting and somebody would investigate it. And my hotline is still open since that time period. And between my hotline and my emails, um, I get reports in here almost on a daily basis on current and past reports. So it may well be the fact that there was a place that people could actually report a sighting if something had occurred. Yeah, that's an important point, uh, Stan. I think you're right. I found the same thing in Colorado. When I went there in 89, there was very little, if any, talk of any sort of unusual events. And then as soon as uh, my you know first article came out and people knew that there was someone willing to take the time and work with them that weren't you know, that wasn't going to judge them or make fun of them or violate any sort of, you know, request for anonymity, uh, boom, reports just start coming out of the woodwork. Uh, I was absolutely amazed and come to find out that stuff had been percolating along the whole time. Nobody reported it because they didn't have anybody to report to. And I think that's a really important point that you bring up. People need to have recourse. Some of your larger groups that are out there, uh, you don't get the kind of attention that you do from a, a private individual that's willing to log the miles and put in the time. Oh, I have to agree. And like I said, you know, people talking about research today and 
you know, unfortunately, from what I'm seeing and talking to many other people in the field, I, I think we're kind of going backwards. I think there was probably a lot more really serious in the field work being done back in the 70s, the 80s, maybe early 90s, but it's just not like it was back in those days uh, from what I'm hearing from different people. What is it about Pennsylvania? Is, it, is there some sort of geophysical properties there? Do you, do you think that there's something that you can actually put your finger on that makes Pennsylvania arguably the most active state in the eastern uh, half of the country. Missouri's another place with a lot of activity, Colorado, California. But Pennsylvania has always, in my mind, been, especially that southern uh, portion, the upper sort of Ohio River Valley. What is it about that area? Why why do you think there's so much activity there and such a variety of activity? Yeah, I've been looking for years to try to find that answer. And, And of course, yes, the state is covered with many very thickly forested and wooded areas. There's a lot of, you know, rivers and, and lakes in Pennsylvania. There's areas I probably have hiked through and investigated throughout many parts of some of the ridges, uh, top of some of the mountains that probably not that many people ever really walk into. There's a lot of interesting areas in Pennsylvania. But something I discovered many years ago when investigating a lot of these cases, especially back in the 70s, was that, one, there's a lot of incidents, a lot of low-level, close-encounter-type UFO events that occur in the vicinity of energy sources. But I'm also finding this as well with more and more cryptid reports. These would occur in the vicinity of of high-tension power lines, power generating stations, gas wells, gas lines, communication towers, railroad tracks, water reservoirs. And I believe for quite a while, a lot of phenomena we're dealing with seems to have some type of energy connection to it. There are many, many questions out there that I don't have the answers for. You know, now I'm out there gathering the information, trying to figure out what's going on, but I think right now that some of what we're dealing with is a little further ahead scientifically than we really have the answers for at this point. So do you think that the hydrocarbons, uh, the gas and oil fields and areas that have you know, oil deposits. Uh, do you think that that may have some sort of bearing on that? The, the very fact that there's hydrocarbon uh, energy? No, I, I really haven't seen that. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I, I see a lot of cases where there's gas wells, there's gas lines, there's gas storage tanks, for example, on trailers, fuel tanks. It's just really unusual how we have so many different, for example, Bigfoot sightings around some of the mobile homes, uh, mobile home communities over the years where some of these different apparatus are. I don't know exactly what it's all about, but it seems that there might be something there. But one thing I should add is one of the most active areas in the country, almost year after year, for reported sightings, which which really stands out, is along the Chestnut Ridge. And the Chestnut Ridge is that mountain range that stretches from Preston County, West Virginia, to Westmoreland, Fayette, Indiana County, and Southwest PA. There are, we get reports year after year, and Fayette County really stands out. It is an area where there is just a long history of very strange encounters with UFOs, Bigfoot, Black Panthers, all kind of strange entities, you name it. Things yeah. have gone on up there, and even in the last year, there's been activity up there. Well, what do you think it could be about that area? Why do you think that's a particular uh, hot spot location in the state? It's a lot of limestone up there. There's a, a small earthquake fault that goes through one part of the ridge, but it's inactive. Yeah, there's a lot of energy sources throughout that area, but it's nothing that really stands out except for the fact that we have these reoccurring reports. Mm-hmm. How about cavern systems in the area? Yeah, there's some well-known caves uh, up in parts of that area. Some are open for the public to go in and explore around. Now, back in the heyday with all the Bigfoot activity back in the 70s, you know, many in daylight and our teams were out there sometimes with minutes to hours after the incident. And then many times we went into various caves where these things may have gone into and we searched all around and never found any evidence they were staying in there. They may have gone in there temporarily, no indication they were going in there and shouldering in there, for example. Well, I'll tell you, uh, your book that uh, just came out, Astonishing Encounters, sure has some absolutely head-scratching cases. All Let's right. do our break, and then we'll get into that. All right. we got more to come with Sam Gordon and Gene and Chris. You're in The Paracast. <laughs> Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. 
37-year-old female and had a heart attack in 2005. This is Alice from New Jersey. I still get angina, even with four stents. I was taking nitro two or three times a week. The very first day after taking heart and body extract, the chest pain was gone. Now I don't wear a nitro patch. Learn the secrets of an effective, natural, 100% organic nutritional supplement for a healthy heart and circulation at hbextract.com. Silver has always been nature's very own antibiotic, and only one system allows you to produce an endless supply of nano-sized silver solutions right from the convenience of your home. Silver Lungs. With the addition of our unique lung delivery system, respiratory infections are targeted directly, where traditional oral administration simply cannot reach. This pioneering method also preserves the original particle sizes and delivers your silver solution directly into the bloodstream. See the Silver Lungs generator and lung delivery system at silverlungs.com. That's silverlungs.com. Thousands of people seeking home security get ripped off every day. And the home security industry wants you to believe that's your only option. They've got hordes of salesmen out there trying to scare you into signing one of their long-term contracts. You get stuck writing huge checks month after month with no way out. It's robbery by contract, and it can cost you thousands. But there's a better way to protect your home. Simply Safe Home Security. Simply Safe has no contracts. None. You'll get award-winning 24-7 protection. Security professionals watching over your home, ready to instantly send police to the rescue for just $14.99 per month. That's less than half what most companies charge. Protect your home the smart way. Visit simplysafedefense.com today for an exclusive 10% offer and get a free keychain remote worth $25. Only when you go to simplysafedefense.com. Simplysafedefense.com. If you're like me, you're concerned about the stock market and the economy. You're asking the questions, but it just doesn't seem that you're getting the right answers. Well, my friends at the Wealth Preservation Institute not only have the answers, but they've put together a free report, How to Survive the Upcoming Economic Collapse and Protect Your 401Ks, IRA Savings, and Retirement Income. Don't hesitate. This report's for free for a limited time by calling 888-772-2929. That's 888-772-2929. Take back your financial lives today. Paid non-attorney spokesperson, Ricky LeBlanc, admitted in Mass only. Sokolov Law, LLC, Chestnut Hill, Mass. Ken Levan, responsible attorney in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Greg Hobby, New Jersey. The choice of lawyer is an important decision that should not be based solely upon advertisements. While this firm maintains joint responsibility, most cases of this type are referred to other attorneys for principal responsibility. If you know what mesothelioma is, you or someone you love has likely been impacted by this devastating cancer. You may be entitled to compensation. Call Sokolov Law today. 1-800-218-HELP. The only known cause of mesothelioma is asbestos exposure. Thousands of hardworking men and women, including many U.S. veterans and industrial workers, have been diagnosed with mesothelioma because manufacturers knew the dangers but put profits ahead of people. An estimated $30 billion in court-ordered trust has been set aside to pay money to asbestos victims. If you or a loved one has been diagnosed with mesothelioma, call now. You may be entitled to receive compensation without ever going to court or filing a lawsuit. Call for a free legal consultation at 1-800-218-HELP. That's 1-800-218-HELP. Healthy, organic, fresh fish, robust, mouth-watering vegetables, all from your home. It's called aquaponics. This brilliant, self-sustaining protein and veggie system is perfect for year-round growing. Know exactly where your food is coming from. Aquaponicsource.com is the one-stop shop for all your needs. Fish, fish food, plumbing, full systems, classes, and more. Learn to build your own system. Go to aquaponicsource.com for a free guide to aquaponics. That's aquaponicsource.com. This is Jacques Vallée, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. So we're exploring all those curious, really curious events that occur in the state of Pennsylvania, which seems to have a pretty high percentage of unusual stuff from cryptids to UFOs. And we've got Stan Gordon here. His book is called Astonishing Encounters, Pennsylvania's Unknown Creatures, Case Book 3. Chris had a question. Couldn't help noticing uh, <laughs> the Butler Ferry account. It's just, it's just mind-boggling that, that something like this could 
fly right, you know, within feet of people. And you have such good quality eyewitness accounts that uh, that describe this thing. Why don't you give us a thumbnail sketch on that particular event? Because this is really unusual. It's, it's almost like something you'd expect to find in uh, outside some pub in Ireland or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, this is something I rarely have ever heard about. You know, yeah. you hear Spock and stories about these very small little flung entities, and to be honest, I really didn't take them very seriously. But in the last couple of years, various people describing me something somewhat similar. And when I uh, first uh, saw this story published on uh, Phantoms and Monsters, I was able to contact the witness, and he gave me permission to uh, redo the, uh, his story that he wrote, and I had correspondence with him for on this a number of times. And it was such a detailed account of what they saw and experienced back in the summer of 2000 in Butler County. And we'll talk more about Butler County, including I just yesterday received a really interesting, very bizarre creature encounter from Butler County that occurred in the last few weeks and did an extensive interview with the witness last night. But there's a lot of history also in Butler County, north of Pittsburgh, of a lot of strange things occurring. This particular case was interesting because there was, I guess, seven, eight people, as I recall, that were visiting a friend, you know, when this very small, <laughs> very small, very detailed little, you know, like, like a fairy, you know, as it was described. And it's just an amazing, amazing account uh, how this unfolded in great detail. Now, this is interesting here because a lot of people, when they look in stories like this, they think, oh, all that stuff happened years ago. And they say the same thing about UFOs. Oh, well, the big sightings occurred years ago. But what you just told us here is this is stuff that is, to the present day, it's happening all the time around us. Yes, there's no doubt about it. Uh, these reports go on year after year. But just like the witness I talked to last night, some people wait for weeks or months or years for they be reported. Just like the witness said, when this happened several weeks ago, they were so, so much nearly in shock about what they saw that they were really reluctant to tell anybody or report it for fear of being ridiculed. And, you know, I've been doing with this for a long time. I've been taking calls, uh, of course, you know, going back many, many years, interviewing many people. So many people, even today, especially with the cryptid reports, they're still extremely reluctant to talk about them publicly, uh, have their names associated with the sighting. Now, the, the UFO phenomenon is taking on a lot more interest, and the ridicule problem is not nearly what it used to be, but it still occurs. And many of the witnesses I talked to today still reluctant to report, especially when you're dealing with not lights in the sky, but large, solid craft close to the ground. Many of the witnesses, even today, who have UFO or cryptid encounters are very reluctant to publicly talk about it because they're still afraid of being ridiculed. It's not as bad with the UFO phenomena. More and more people are willing to talk about it. But those witnesses who have encountered something very close at very low level are still quite often really reluctant to publicly talk about it. But uh, the sightings go on year after year. I mean, even this year has been pretty steady with reports coming in. Uh, we've had a little surge in activity, actually, uh, in August and September with some interesting reports that have come in. Uh, so things are happening out there, and it's, it's, I'm sure not just in Pennsylvania, but it's probably well across the country. But, there are, again, there's not a lot of good information coming in from some of the states out there. You know, why don't you give it a, a, an example of some of your, your end-of-summer uh, uh, fall reports that you're currently working on? You want me to tell you about this, this really unusual entity report? It, it happened in late August or the first week of September of this year. I just interviewed the witness last night. And this took place on a rural road in eastern Butler County about 5 p.m. It was a sunny day, and the witness was just taking a leisurely drive through that scenic uh, rural area. And the driver was focusing on the road ahead, looking around. Uh, to the right side was a stream, and there was some woods to the left. And going down the road, and then suddenly, in about 15 to 20 feet ahead, and about three-quarters of the way across the road, the witness sees something that, found was very hard to describe, and it was moving from right to left ahead of the vehicle. The first thought the driver was it was a deer, but then quickly realized it was unlike anything they had ever seen before or even might even exist, and that's because the first feature caught their attention looked similar to the head of a deer. However, the head was angled straight up, 
and the head was not real pointy. It was kind of narrowed at the top and then rounded off. The body was similar in color to a deer and appeared to be about four to four and a half feet tall and appeared to be smooth, but it was unclear if it was covered with skin and had no apparent hair. And the being now was observed, was observed just from the side and never looked towards the vehicle. And no details could be seen on the face because of that. The arms looked very short and out of proportion to the rest of the body, and the arms were held in very close to the chest area. The hands appeared to be very small. It gave the impression they were either being held together or possibly holding something. And what the witness found hard to describe was that there appeared to be something aching down, possibly some type of fabric that was covering around the leg area, as no legs or feet could be observed. And the driver said this being just glided above the roadway, and even stranger was that behind the head, there was an odd effect. And the witness said it looked sort of like a time-lapse picture, like a cartoon when the character is moving so fast the body can't keep up with it. The witness commented it looked like the head portion was losing streaks of body matter as it glided across the road. Within a couple of seconds, the car approached the location of the road where the creature had been gliding. The driver looked all around, but the being was nowhere in sight and was not seen again. The witness was stunned, could not understand how this creature could be gone in seconds. The entire observation lasted maybe seven, eight seconds. The witness also mentioned that it was unusual that the creature wasn't seen as it came from the right side of the road and was only first observed when it was already gliding three-quarters of the way across the road ahead. So it's a very interesting, unusual report. Chris, you're continuing or what? So I'm, I'm a little confused. Was this a creature upright? It was on two legs, in other words? It was upright, but they couldn't see any legs and appeared to be floating or gliding atop the surface of the roadway. Did they notice any antlers or anything uh, coming out of the head that would uh, give it more of the appearance of a deer? Nothing at all. The only reason she even said like a deer was, one, the, the coloration was somewhat similar to the mm-hmm. deer, and two, the, the head shape was somewhat like that, but it was pointing straight upward. And there was no other indication of a deer, and, and immediately realized there wasn't any deer or any kind of creature she had ever seen before. And this is the middle of the day. <laughs> Five o'clock, a, a beautiful afternoon. And, My you goodness. know, over <laughs> the years, we've had other floating entity reports, some of which I mentioned in the new Astonish Encounters book, that we have had a history, and it's not just in Pennsylvania, but I'm sure you may have had some of these out your way as well, of yeah. these entities that appear to float. Yeah. Yeah, I've actually <laughs> had the uh, dubious distinction of seeing one, and, and it had a full rack of antlers, too, <laughs> which freaked me out. I was naked in my greenhouse shower, <laughs> so it was rather disconcerting. Um <laughs> And it was silhouetted against the uh, still lit sky. The sun had gone down probably 10 minutes, 15 minutes before. But, um, yeah, these um, these types of entities are often, as are uh, ET-type entities, uh, are, you know, you'll hear reports of them gliding and not appearing to have their lower bodies, their legs, or um, from the torso down actually moving. We've got Stan Gordon joining Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. You are listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Conspiracy Journal is your number one source for the hidden world of the weird and strange. We bring you thought-provoking and controversial material for free-thinking individuals who are seeking what is really going on in our world today. Some of this material may adversely affect you. Other pieces are meant to enlighten. Either way, be prepared to be intrigued by such things as the reality of UFOs, ghosts, strange creatures from time and space, hidden conspiracies, time travel, Nikola Tesla, suppressed technology, and a whole lot more. You can find out more by visiting our website at conspiracyjournal.com. There you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter sent directly to your email address. Find out what they don't want you to know.
Are your Google search results killing you? Unflattering content in blogs, news articles, online reviews, social media, or other sources can jeopardize your reputation, your business, and your livelihood. Let Reputation.com help. Our patented technology will make the truth about you more visible while pushing down unwanted negative content. Improve your Google search results. Call Reputation.com at 1-800-831-0771 for a free consultation. That's 800-831-0771. Hey, Berkey Guy here. Are you still drinking unfiltered tap water? Does your water contain chlorine or fluoride? Will you have drinkable water in an emergency? The Berkey Guy is here to help you remove these and other potential contaminants from your water, thus helping you drink clean, purified water. We offer Berkey water purification systems at the lowest available prices online. Don't go another moment without Berkey System. Over the last 10 years, we've helped thousands drink clean, purified water. Join them by visiting GoBerkey.com or call me, the Berkey Guy, at 877-886-3653. That's 877-886-3653. Paid non attorney spokesperson Adam Pulaski of the Pulaski Law Firm with principal office in Houston, Texas, is the attorney responsible for the content of this ad. This ad is not legal advice, and the choice of a lawyer should not be based solely upon advertisement. Services may not be available in all states. Attention, Zarelto users. If you or a loved one took Zarelto and suffered a serious bleeding event, you may be entitled to financial compensation. Zarelto is a popular prescription blood thinner used to prevent blood clots and protect patients from strokes. These serious bleeding events have led to numerous cases of hospitalization and even death. Phone lines are open 24 7. Call 800 261 0937. That's 800 261 0937. Do you owe $10,000 or more to the IRS? Then get on board with the tax admiral and let us steer your way to financial freedom. The IRS is the largest collection agency in the world. They can freeze your bank accounts, seize your car, home, will garnish your paychecks and benefits. Don't take on the IRS alone. I can fight for you using industry secrets that can help stop the IRS. I'll cut your penalties, slash your interest, and reduce your overall tax bill. Sometimes I can even get it zeroed out completely. We're an A-rated company with over 30 years experience helping people clean up their mess with the IRS. And we have a nice. 85% customer satisfaction rating. If you owe $10,000 or more to the IRS, are facing an audit, a lien, or levy, then call me right away. Call 800-287-7180. Again, that's 800-287-7180. 800-287-7180. This is Dan Pilla. Do you owe the IRS money you can't pay? Are tax debts crippling you? I've defended people from the IRS for over 30 years. I've helped thousands and I can help you too. I wrote the book on IRS settlement and I'm telling you, there's no such thing as a hopeless case. Call 800-34-NO-TAX to finally get free of IRS debt. With the IRS's new programs, there's never been a better time to solve your problem. Call 800-34-NO-TAX. That's 800-34-NO-TAX or my website, danpilla.com. This is Micah Hanks of the Gray Alien Report, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Is it all monsters all the time on the Paracast? Well, when we look at Astonishing Encounters, Pennsylvania's Unknown Creatures, case book three by Stan Gordon. Maybe that's true. Chris, you want to continue with what you started with? You got to you got to ask yourself I'm sure from time to time what the heck is this about? I mean, why do you think that these types of creatures are being seen and and do you think that there's something actually physical or do you think there's something more akin to some sort of supernatural or paranormal type uh effect? Well, yeah, I, I really got to go back to the, the 1973 period. You know, as you probably recall, that was the time we had that massive probably the largest outbreak in history of UFO and Bigfoot sightings here in Pennsylvania, but also many parts of the country were experiencing that massive flap of UFO sightings, which actually peaked in the fall of 1973. A lot of activity going on, but also there was quite a bit of Bigfoot activity going on throughout the country as well, but not to the level that was happening here in Pennsylvania. I mean, we had hundreds and hundreds of UFO sightings going on. It started January 1st, and it continued through 73. And more reports continue in 1974. But it was in the summer of 73, as all this other UFO activity is going on, that we had that major outbreak of Bigfoot sightings. And that went on for weeks and months. And it started here in southwestern Pennsylvania, and it continued through many other parts of the state. It was just an amazing time to live through. And, And many of those Bigfoot encounters 
they weren't nighttime, they were daylight. In some cases, you had multiple creatures being seen, two or three at the same time. In some cases, these things were extremely close to people, especially in cases where they walked out, for example, in front of cars or were seen walking near uh, homes, for example, and people got a very, very, very detailed look at these things. So, you know, I started looking into Bigfoot sightings in Pennsylvania soon after the Kecksburg incident in 1965 when I began my field research into UFOs and all kind of other phenomena. And I had always felt from what information was available on Bigfoot in Pennsylvania and from people I was interviewing at that time that Bigfoot, if it was real and appeared there was something to it, that it was probably some type of unknown zoological creature, some type of unknown primate. For years and years, I've always felt that that was probably the case, and I continue to keep an open mind to all possibilities. All this activity is going on in 1973. Now, you got to remember, back in 1973, a lot of the witnesses at that period, they saw something, they encountered something, they made calls to the police departments. In some cases, they called the news media. They wanted help, or they wanted to find out what was going on. You know, my first group was the Westmoreland County UFO Study Group. It was founded in 1970. We started out as a very small research group. You know, I, I wanted to uh, try to set up a, a volunteer group of people who could go out and look at these cases firsthand and try to respond to these cases soon after the call came in, hopefully to get on the scene of an incident while the phenomenon was ongoing. So that's what I focused on and what I did. And the group was kind of unique in that the majority of the people were people who had some type of specialized backgrounds. There were, there were scientists and engineers and technicians and former military intelligence people and police officers. And I had many people who dealt with me anonymously with, from the, with their positions from Westinghouse, Golf Research, Al, Alcoa Research around Pittsburgh, from some of the colleges and universities. It was a really interesting group of people, many who came in very skeptically, but many of them spent years with me out in the field and began to realize, seeing the patterns of what we were dealing with, seeing the evidence we were finding, that there were indeed mysteries out there we couldn't explain. But going back to that time period, as these reports are coming in from widespread areas, a lot of the police departments, and in, in quite a lot of cases, some of the uh, police departments were referring cases to my teams to investigate. So we were out there, you know, very quickly after some of these events. Some of the reports were highly unusual. For example, in some cases, our teams would get out to a location where a Bigfoot sighting had taken place, and there will be trails of footprints that would suddenly stop and disappear. But the ground conditions were suitable. There should have been more tracks. And then patterns began to emerge. We would have, for example, a UFO sighting in a certain area. And within minutes, the hours, the days later, we would have a Bigfoot sighting or vice versa. And then we had some of the most amazing, well-documented cases where a UFO and a Bigfoot are seen together at the same time and place. But then, as that time continued on with some of these Bigfoot cases, some even stranger accounts came, which began to suggest that Bigfoot may not be a normal flesh and blood animal, as hard as that is for me to say. That uh, brings up some interesting points, and I think for some of our newer listeners who uh, perhaps have not heard you on the show before, I think the one case uh, that you were there within minutes of the report of the um, Bigfoot-like creature coming out of the of, of the light that appeared to be surrounding a craft. Why don't you give us a, an idea of how that case unfolded and some of the, the pretty startling details, including gunplay and everything else. So, and actually, the, the creatures did not come out of the UFO, but I'll explain it as the story goes along. So this goes back to that wave of reports back in 1973, uh, October 25th, this was again in Fayette County. Here we go, Fayette County again. I have been receiving many sightings during that 24-hour period on my hotline from around Pennsylvania. There been a lot of UFO sightings going on that day. Around 10.30 that evening, I received a phone call from uh, a state trooper from the Uniontown State Police Barracks outside of Uniontown in Fayette County. Now, he had just come back from investigating this multiple witness UFO incident, UFO landing that happened uh, in that rural area up there. And uh, he called me from the barracks. Uh, another key witness was with him at the time, and I interviewed him. He was highly upset. Trooper told me, he said, he felt there was a good chance of something was still up in that pasture. He wanted me to get a team up there as soon as we could. You know, we're still a pretty good distance away. It's already late at night, but we got our team together. We got our uh, 
equipment checked out. We got our radios, our radiation gear, and other equipment, and we found our way up there and got there in early morning hours, and we went to the pasture. Well, actually, we met the key witness, who was actually the son of the farmer who owned the farm where this had taken place. Then his father arrived, and we went up to the, the farm. And what we found out was that around 9 o'clock, about 15 people in that rural area had observed this object, a big red sphere about as big as barn, about 100 feet off the ground, and slowly moving downward. And the people were all standing outside watching this thing with different uh, directions. And the farmer's son is riding down the, the farm lane towards his dad's farm to visit him, and he sees this thing, and he goes off to a neighbor's house to get a better viewpoint of it. And he and some young boys watch this thing. It looks like it's coming down. So they decide they're going to run up there and see what this thing is. But before they did that, he went over to his dad's farm. He grabbed a thirty out 6 and a handful of ammunition. Included in that handful of ammunition were two tracers. They proceeded down the farm road. He's in his truck, and they parked the truck at an angle so they could see the path going up towards the pasture. And they noticed that it looked like something was draining the power from the headlights, which they had never had that happen before, but that's something that's been very common historically with close-range UFO cases. And as they made their way up the hill to the top of the pasture, and they're standing there looking, they're standing there in amazement, because about 250 feet away is this huge object that's on the ground or right above it. Now, as they were approaching down that farm road towards the pasture, in the distance, dogs in the area are going crazy, they hear this high-pitched whining sound, and they hear this baby crying sounds going on. And they get louder as they approach closer to the pasture. When they get up into the field, they're looking at this object, which is now like a big, maybe 100 foot or more in diameter, bright white dome that's illuminating the whole area, making that high-pitched whining noise. And they're standing there in amazement. They can't believe what they're seeing. And they're studying this thing, trying to figure out what it is, but then... They notice along this barbed wire fence line 75 feet away, two tall figures slowly walking in their direction. And their first thought, of course, like, these got to be bear. What else could they be? Now, of course, the farmer's son's been hunting for years, and he knew bear. And he said it was very obvious very quickly these were not bear. The one in front was about 8 feet tall. The one behind her was about 7 feet tall. They were cut with long, dark, matted hair. They had bright green glowing eyes, self-luminescent glowing eyes. They were making this baby crying sound. The arms were so long, they were almost down to the ground. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. So the one in front is moving slowly ahead of the one behind it, and they're walking along the barbed wire fence. Well, at one point, one of the boys yells, shoot him, shoot him. The guy decides to take a shot. One of the boys is so scared, he runs out of the pasture. The guy takes the first shot, which turns out to be a tracer. So for the hunters out there, they know you, you get to that luminous trail. That's all you get when they fire that tracer round. He fired a second tracer. But when he did, something really interesting occurred. The largest of the two creatures made this loud crying sound and reached out as though to grab that tracer. And the exact moment it did that, the object in the field disappeared. It just vanished. Stan Gordon's with us with Gene and Chris. You're in The Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. Ray Perkins, a reclusive veteran burned out from the Gulf War, lives tortured by relentless, perplexing nightmares. Nightmares of a horrific battle in deep space and of a mysterious woman suffering in agony for her devastated world. A woman not yet born, calling across centuries to him. Then, a coincidence leads him to his destiny, his chance to alter the universe. Attack, Attack of the Rockaway. The former fiction editor for Star Wars and Indiana Jones, Robert Simpson, writes, The soul of the novel Attack of the Rockoids lies in its heart and passion for building a convincing tale of a love that spans the galaxy. A thrilling story. Attack, Attack of the Rockaway is available now. Read a sample chapter and get a special discount off of the cover price at our website, rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. Attack, Attack of the Rockoids, Rockoids, a novel in the grand science fiction tradition. This is a healthcare alert from the Pain Relief Hotline. 
If you, a family member, or a loved one suffers from knee, back, shoulder, or ankle pain and have Medicare as your primary insurance, we've got great news. You don't have to suffer any longer. You can immediately qualify for a pain relieving brace at little or no cost to you by calling our 24 7 pain relief hotline at 866 389 0620. Delivery is free and all paperwork is handled for you. If you are on Medicare and have knee, back, shoulder, or ankle pain, don't wait. You can qualify to immediately receive a pain relieving brace at little or no cost by calling our 24 7 pain hotline now at 866 389 0620. Our representatives are standing by 24-7 to take your call and rush you your pain-relieving brace at little or no cost to you. Shipping is free and all paperwork is handled for you. Just call 866-389-0620. That's 866-389-0620. Again, 866-389-0620. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. So there we go. We're hitting our second segment for the Paracast with Gene and Chris. The book is Astonishing Encounters about Pennsylvania's unknown creatures. Stan Gordon wrote the book. And we're just detailing case after case here, and it just keeps going on. So we have a lot of questions from our listeners that Chris will get to shortly, Stan. I just want to ask you here, as we're looking over all these horrifying things here, do you find a situation that sometimes happens elsewhere where you're investigating a case, possibly UFO sighting, but when you talk to the people, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more going on. With that particular witness, what's your perception? Oh yeah, that's that's not unusual at all. But also, you got to be very careful of how you interview the witnesses. You don't want to put thoughts in their minds. You don't want to put words in their mouth. So you got to be really careful how you interview people. But very commonly over the years, when we are out to different locations and interviewing people about one type of phenomena, when you begin to listen to their story, a lot of them are so reluctant to bring it up. But you find out that. There was a lot of other things that may have been going on around their property as well. You know, some of them, you know, they call you on a UFO case, but then they're talking about hearing strange sounds and their animals reacting strange and hearing strange screams and then seeing something large and hairy or something else. And some of them have history of other type of paranormal events that have gone on themselves or other members of the family. So quite often... You begin to hear these things, and I've dealt with multitudes of people over the years who themselves and their families have had a history of dealing with all kind of phenomena. Stan, have you noticed, uh, like during flat periods, like in 73, that there's an unusual amount of, uh, of government or military activity in these areas? Uh, have you noticed any sort of either official or unofficial apparent interest by the government in these flap areas and these in, in these uh, <laughs> inexplicable uh, uh, events that are being reported? Uh, I can say yes. What I should do, if you don't mind, maybe I should finish up the end of that story because that's where we might bring in some of this other questions you're asking about. Okay, cool. Yeah, let's finish up with that because we're, we're, right. we're getting to the good part. <laughs> let's give a little summary here. So the object just physically disappears after the man shot that, at that tracer at that large creature. And at that point, the two creatures slowly turn around, start walking back towards the woods along the barbed wire fence. At that point, the man starts firing live ammo into the creatures. And I remember I was in touch with him for years after this happened. He's now deceased. And he told me how he'll never forget how the, the biggest of the creature with those glowing green eyes just, starts, just kept staring back at him as he's fired into it with uh, his 30 odd six. And there's no effect on these creatures whatsoever, which, you know, I don't recommend people shooting these things. But during the time it happened, as I mentioned in my Silent Invasion book, when I go into great detail about all these cases, that numerous people did shoot at these creatures with different type of weapons, and there was no indication that they were slowed down or hurt whatsoever. And so anyhow, at that point, uh, these fellows run back to the truck, get out of the area, go back to the farmhouse, they uh, take the family out of there to a neighbor, and they call the state police. And when the trooper arrives 45 minutes later, 
Um, he said, I'm here to investigate the incident. And the witness was very reluctant to talk about it. He said, look, just forget about it. You're going to think I'm crazy. And the trooper said, look, we had a report last night, the night before, of two similar creatures up on the mountain. I have to investigate the incident. So they go up in the troop car, from the patrol car, up into the, up into the pasture, and they're looking around for evidence. And what the trooper told me was, over on the, in the area where the object was on the ground or right above it, that whole area was self-luminescent and glowing about 100 feet or more in diameter. The farm animals wouldn't go into it. He shined his flashlight beam until he could barely see the beam. He said if he had a newspaper, he could sat down within that glowing area and read the newspaper from the light coming off of it. And it began to get even stranger and stranger, the accounts. Um, at that point, they soon after, they went back to the barracks. When they back, went back to the state police barracks, both the trooper and the witness were taken to two separate rooms and were separately interviewed. And then they contacted me to send my, my team up. And then other things got even stranger, which we didn't even get, have time to even get into. Got stranger while we were there on the scene that night. The late Dr. Berthold Schwartz, whose name you probably recognize, was a very well-known psychiatrist. He came up here on his own, spent about a week up here interviewing all the people who were involved in the case and went away convinced these people all telling the truth. But it's a very, very intriguing story, uh, which I wrote the whole thing up in Silent Invasion because it's very detailed and gets extremely even stranger. That's interesting. But now to answer your question, there were, there were a number of things that happened uh, during the 70s, even before the 70s, um, and cases since then, uh, some of the cases that I worked on, which suggested that there may have been a government interest in what was going on. Yeah. But yes, I can tell you, during that time period, the 73 and 74 was this massive wave, a number of odd things had occurred. Um, I can tell you that there were some strange accounts. One was a, an incident uh, at a trailer park where... Um, we had been out um, investigating another incident in a little town called Harmony, and there had been a sighting that evening of a, of a Bigfoot about 45 feet away from with us uh, in the garden, not far from his dog was going crazy when this thing was nearby, and the state police had called my team to go out to investigate it. We were down there investigating it, and as we're finishing up that evening, we get a call over the uh, the 911 radio in my car that the state pol that the police up in Derry Township, which again that borders the Chestnut Ridge in Westmoreland County. It still is one of the most active areas year after year for Bigfoot encounters. Why, we don't know. But anyhow, that they had an incident that evening out at, the, um, out at this mobile home community, and um, they wanted uh, our team up there as soon as we could. So we left from the other scene and proceeded up to that location. And anyhow, when we got there, we found out that people in this mobile home um, they heard something scratching on the back of their trailer, heard like a baby crying sound, and the power was going on and off in their mobile home. So when we got there, we interviewed the people. We found out the woman had opened up the back door, and here's a Bigfoot type thing standing there. It runs between the trailers. Other people see it, and it screams and runs off. But we also found that the main power line, here's a power connection again, from the power supply that went underground to the trailer had been pulled out of the ground and found that very fascinating. The police had got there before we did, found some footprints, possible footprints, and preserved them for us to look at when we got there. But here's the, the interesting thing of some of the oddities. I believe it was about a week later, and I, and I wrote it in my book. I can't remember the exact date now. We got a, we, I was on the phone with another call when I got an emergency call from the operator breaking in that the woman at that site needed to talk to me right away. And when she did, she told me that this man had shown up uh, at the trailer court. He was acting very unusual. He indicated to her that he knew me or was working with me, and uh, he wanted to talk to her about the incident the other night. And the reason she called was she had found some hair uh, right over along that part of the trailer where the footprints were, and she wanted me to have these hair samples, and she couldn't get a hold of me, and this guy told her that uh, he would take the samples and give them to me. And, of course, we never found out who that guy was, and I never received the samples. But before he left, uh, there was a little boy standing there with a, I believe it was one of those old Polaroid cameras you pulled out, and 
Um, the film came out and exposed right there on the scene. He was taking some pictures uh, of the footprint, and he went over and pulled the the uh, pictures out of the kid's hand and tore them up and made some kind of comment. You, you made pictures for us, and the guy went and destroyed the footprints, and people started yelling, and he got out of there really quick. He said he almost turned his car sideways speeding out of the area, and uh, we never did find out who this guy was. So that was interesting. But going back to that case in Fayette County of the UFO landing in the Bigfoot, very intriguing case. We spent many days up in that area going back, interviewing people, searching the area, checking up on that case. And for years we did follow-up investigations. The book is Astonishing Encounters. We're talking to Stan Gordon with Gene and Chris. You're in The Paracast. Do you need a website? Well, you can get a great deal on hosting services with Namecheap's legendary coupon code. They're offering substantial hosting discounts on shared hosting, business hosting, VPS hosting, reseller hosting, and even dedicated servers. Namecheap is preferred by millions. It's backed by a money-back guarantee. Use the coupon code LEGENDARY to cash in on the special deal at Namecheap.com, Namecheap.com. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. Sciatica, lower back pain, hip pain, poor posture. If you suffer from any of these problems, get ready to relax. Introducing an amazing product that's been in the market for over 25 years, the Sacro Wedgie. It was invented by a football coach using a common sense osteopath technique. He created this device to help his athletes by isolating and supporting the sacrum, which is the keystone of our anatomy. This wedge-shaped bone is in the center of our hips, where a lot of pain starts. Simply relax 20 minutes daily on the amazingly simple Sacro Wedgie and let gravity do the work, helping muscles rebalance and start releasing nerves. Sit in the sacro wedgie at the computer or while traveling to help correct posture to finally help relieve those stubborn aches and pains for only $33.95. It's made in the USA, so click the family-owned website at sacrowedgie.com, spelled S-A-C-R-O-W-E-D-G-Y.com, or call 1-800-737-9295. That's 1-800-737-9295. Relax your back pain away with the sacro wedgie. The human body is more than 60% water. Your brain and muscles are 75% water. And your blood is 92% water. Water is vital to your body, and alkalizing your water is the key to keep it running at its best. AlkaVision Plasma pH drops keep your entire body healthy, boosts energy, promotes weight loss, and even fights cancer. Call 800-518-7615 or go to AlkaVision.com to find out more. That's A-L-K-A-Vision.com. Hi, Peter Vaccaro for ParanormalDate.com. Are you looking for love in all the wrong places? Now you have a chance to change that by signing up for free at ParanormalDate.com. This incredible dating site puts people of like minds together. People who are interested in the strange, the unusual, mysteries, ghosts, UFOs, and the afterlife, and so much more. ParanormalDate.com was developed for you. People seeking a viable alternative to the other dating services. You can join for free by going to ParanormalDate.com, and if you decide you like it and want to connect with people, use the code GEORGE for a substantial discount. Mark Rawlings, president of ParanormalDate.com, says so many people hunger to share their experiences about the paranormal, the unexplainable, or the afterlife, and so much more, and this is the source for them to meet and share that common interest. So sign up for free at ParanormalDate.com, ParanormalDate.com. And use the code GEORGE if you decide to connect with someone you like. Virtually anyone can hack your cell phone and track your calls, your texts, your emails, your every movement. But only if they can detect a signal. Stay one step ahead of hackers and Big Brother with a Block It Pocket. A custom-made pocket infused with pure silver that creates a complete Faraday enclosure for your cell phone. For free shipping to the lower 48, visit BlockItPocket.com or call 888-315-9618. BlockItPocket.com. Enhancing health and privacy. 
We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. I can just sit back and listen. That's all I have to do. These incredible Yeah, I'm, I'm loving these little details like Bigfoot sounding like babies uh, whining or crying. That's an unusual detail that I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of from uh, other cases. That, that's a pretty interesting uh, little correlation there. Oh, yeah, and that was very common, you know, back in the day. And even, you know, more recent years, these people have told us these things make sounds like a woman pain screaming, baby crying, high-pitched whistle. Another thing was very common, a case where people said these things were making sounds as though they were having trouble breathing, like they were having, like asthma. Very, very deep uh, breathing sounds. In fact, during one night on one of the farms, as these things kept coming back, and these people had a big cornfield, this thing had just come right by the barn, into the barn. We had footprints in there, and this thing was running through the cornfield, and we were chasing it through the cornfield in the dark, trying to catch up to this thing while it's making these loud sounds, and I was recording the sounds as I'm running through the field after it. Oh, jeez. I'm not sure if I'd have the cojones to run after a Bigfoot uh, with a tape recorder. <laughs> <laughs> now, you watch a lot of these shows over the years been on TV with Bigfoot investigators, and they're out there looking for Bigfoot. And as I recall, some of them a few years ago, when they heard or saw something, they never went after it and went the opposite way. Yeah. <laughs> but anyhow, the, the story I wanted to tell you about was what happened in one of our follow-up investigations with one of the key witnesses. I believe it was back in the 1980s, and we went back to follow up and do some follow-up with the, with the main uh, key witness. And we start talking to him. Now, we never did any hypnosis with him because some very odd things happened to him in the field that night, and we never did any hypnosis with him. But now, years later, we consider that maybe that possibility. So I'm there with my assistant, uh, the late George Lutz. George worked out with me in the field since about 1971, and uh, he passed away a few years ago. He was a retired major in the Air Force Reserve. And he was a very good outdoorsman, and we investigated many, many cases together. And we were following up in this case, and as we're talking about hypnosis, the witness looks at us and says, why do you want to do it again? And we looked at each other like, what are you talking about? And he said, well, back when it happened, he said, he was telling us about an incident that happened maybe one, I can't remember, two to three weeks after it happened in 1973. And we said, what are you talking about? Well, all these years, he thought, that these two mystery men who met with him were part of my group. One of the guys that met with him, there was two men that came to his house to follow up, we found out at the time. One was dressed in an Air Force uniform. The other one was, was in a suit. I believe that it was the Air Force man that arrived there on the scene that um, he had with him. He was carrying a, um, like a, a briefcase with him, the Air Force officer. And they wanted him to go into detail about what he remembered that night, what the craft, what the UFO looked like, what the creature looked like, and he gave a lot of detail. Then, to his surprise, the Air Force guy opened up the briefcase and had all these photographs of both UFOs and Bigfoot. And I remember him telling me that one of the pictures of a Bigfoot was this large, hairy creature climbing over a fence, I believe in Georgia, with a dead pig under its arm. And they wanted to know if it looked similar to what he saw. And then they asked permission. They said they'd like to hypnotize him, and apparently they did at that time. And after it was done, they said, you know, we'll be in touch with you, and he never heard from them again. Yeah. They hopped into their 1950s-era brand-new black Cadillac and disappeared. <laughs> but, um, but you also asked me, has been government interests? And I can tell you, during that time period, um, there was some other mystery men events that were going on as we're investigating all these cases, but I did receive a call from a man who told me that he worked for the government, that they were very interested in the investigations we were doing on Bigfoot. I was given the name of a fo the phone number, an address, and a contact for a lab in Washington, D.C. in the event that we come across any bodies or any really significant physical evidence which I never had the opportunity to need, unfortunately, at that time. 
But later on, I can tell you that I was actually visited, and I was in touch with these guys for years, and now they're, at least one of them I know is deceased. Uh, they were actual representatives of, of, a gov- of our government, and they came at the time and were very interested in what I was doing, were very supportive. You know, I, I knew these guys for years after it happened. Anyhow, they were able to, they, I gave them the phone number I was given. They confirmed it was a an inter, a actual government uh, official number in Washington. So, yes, there was some interesting things taking place. Well, and then, of course, your very first cases, the infamous Kecksburg event, uh, is filled with uh, convoys and, 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 you know, security people keeping uh, locals away from the area where this this strange acorn-shaped object came down. For some of our uh, new listeners who, who maybe aren't familiar with the Kecksburg case, why don't you give us a quick thumbnail on that one, especially uh, mention what happened, uh, what you suspect happened after the object was carted away. Okay, well, we, we could spend days talking about Kecksburg, and as you may or may not be aware, this year is the 50th anniversary. So December 9th, 1965 is when it happened. This is the 50th anniversary approaching. So I've spent 50 years investigating this incident. I was 16 years old when it happened, Thursday night, December 9, 1965. And as you realize, my interest began in 1959 when I was 10 years old. And, and to your surprise of your listeners, in all the years I've been doing this, which now this year is 56 years, I have never had my own UFO or Bigfoot encounter. And uh, that surprises <laughs> well, a lot of people. What, 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 thousand, what keeps you going, Stan? What keeps you going? <laughs> what keeps you going is the fact that you get people year after year whose lives are still changed by these events. That something is going on year after year that still we have no explanation for. And I guess I'm always hopeful that that next call, that next case, will provide the evidence that finally may close the door on some of these events. But yeah. it hasn't happened so far. Well, that, that brings me to, to one of the questions uh, here in our question bank by Gogs Mackay, who's one of our uh, staff members here at the Paracast. And he mentions here that both Kecksburg and Roswell supposedly had military personnel threatening locals to keep silent. And I, he wonders if you've ever checked in to the legality of U.S. Armed Forces giving such orders on U.S. soil in peacetime. And after you've maybe addressed that question, then let's get a – a quick sort of blow-by-blow blow, um, uh, account of the actual uh, Kecksburg event and uh, some of your 50 years' worth of your analysis uh, summed up. It would be best for me to give you some of the scenario of what took place and then fill in with some of that and remind me also about a very interesting men in black situation with the Kecksburg incident. So actually, my, uh, my uh, interest in the men in black actually goes back my first encounters as such, even though I wasn't there, but with witnesses talking about these type of experiences goes back to Kecksburg in 1965. Let's do our break here, Stan, and then we'll talk about the men in black. Of course, we call them the men in black, the galaxy protectors, because we're repeating the song from Will Smith for the first movie, if you remember that. Go to plus.theparacast.com, P-L-U-S dot theparacast.com. Learn about our new lifetime membership for Paracast Plus. We have Stan Gordon. We're talking Astonishing Encounters and now Men in Black with Gene and Chris. You're in The Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. Hi, I'm Dr. Sam Nussbaum with the Anthem Foundation. Premature birth is the leading cause of death of babies and disabilities for children. That's why we support the March of Dimes to help mothers have full-term pregnancies and healthy babies. Join us in supporting cutting-edge research, treatment and outreach to help moms during their pregnancy, and give every baby a healthy start in life. Learn how you can help at marchofdimes.org. My dad was 59 when he collapsed from a heart attack late last year. Just this past August was when we spread his ashes on the St. Croix River. I loved my dad, but boy was he stubborn. He hadn't been to the doctor in over 25 years. His excuse? He simply couldn't afford it. He wasn't a rich man by any means. At less than $107 per month, libertyoncall.org would have been the perfect alternative for my father. Don't wait. Go to libertyoncall.org right now for not just your sake, but for the sake of your loved ones. Again, that's libertyoncall.org. 
Attention all men. Are you urinating more frequently? Do you wake up to urinate? Are you having a slower, weaker stream? Don't ignore the warning signs of your aging prostate. Get your free bottle of Super Beta Prostate. Super Beta Prostate is guaranteed to support a more complete emptying of your bladder, a fuller, stronger stream, and less waking at night to urinate. Super Beta Prostate is a product that I really like. I endorse it. I use it myself. I was very pleasantly surprised that Super Beta Prostate helped me fairly quickly. Super Beta Prostate is formulated with a natural plant enzyme called beta cytosterol. It's so powerful, you'd have to take 100 salt palmetto pills to get the same sterols as just one Super Beta Prostate tablet. Don't ignore the warning signs of your aging prostate. Call now to get your free bottle of Super Beta Prostate. Call 1-800-853-1203. That's 1-800-853-1203. 800-853-1203. If you're like me, you're concerned about the stock market and the economy. You're asking the questions, but it just doesn't seem that you're getting the right answers. Well, my friends at the Wealth Preservation Institute not only have the answers, but they put together a free report, How to Survive the Upcoming Economic Collapse and Protect Your 401Ks, IRA Savings, and Retirement Income. Don't hesitate. This report's for free for a limited time by calling 888-772-2929. That's 888-772-2929. Take back your financial lives today. Hello? Congratulations. For what? For losing all that weight. How'd you do it so fast? ASAP. ASAP what? What's that mean? Are you ready to get as skinny as possible, as soon as possible, as simple as possible, and as sexy as possible? I'm listening. Then get with the ASAP program. It's real and it works. No smooth talk, no slick advertising, and no exaggerated claims of success. I've got to know more. Welcome to ASAP, as slim as possible. Whether you have 10, 20, or 50 pounds to lose, ASAP is your weight loss answer. ASAP targets the abnormal fat reserves and makes them available to be burned as fuel and contains no caffeine or hormones. Order ASAP at wholesale prices or join the team to share the business with others. Visit GCNteam.com or call 877-878-4203. GCNteam.com or call 877-878-4203. Lose weight and look great with ASAP, as slim as possible. We use mobile devices right against our bodies every day, but growing scientific evidence has emerged showing serious health risks associated with exposure to EMF radiation emitted from these devices. The solution is Defender Shield, the most effective mobile radiation shielding ever developed. Defender Shield blocks virtually 100% of EMF radiation from cell phones, tablets, and laptops and starts at just $64.99. Buy now at DefenderShield.com. For 10% off, use promo code GCN. DefenderShield.com, the worldwide leader in mobile radiation shielding. Hi, this is James Fox from Chasing UFOs. You're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. So, Stan Gordon, I was going to ask you about Men in Black because we discussed them on last week's show with Nick Redfern. So you've heard about people who've run into so-called Men in Black. Are they supposedly, at least the encounters you've heard about, those who seem to be government agents or something else? Well... I, I think from some of the accounts I've heard from different people and some of the cases I looked at that we may be dealing with more than one origin for some of these mystery men reports. But uh, it, it's very fascinating. And, and over the years, because of the different cases I've been involved with, some of them are very, very strange encounters from what I'm recalling from many, many years ago. And other cases suggest they may well be government-related. So let me tell you about the Kexper case and how it might relate. Before we go on hearing about the men in black in Kecksburg, I don't want to say that we're encountering any men in black phenomenon here. But it seems that over the past few weeks, we're hooked up with Chris through a pretty solid Skype connection. And it keeps getting knocked off. So I don't know. We're going to have to explore that. Okay, Stan, tell us about the MIB. All right, well, let's go back to Kecksburg. It started uh, Thursday night, December 9, 1965. I'm 16 years old. I'm tuned in to KDK Radio in Pittsburgh. They have a well-known radio talk show. It's called Contact. The host of the show in Pittsburgh was the late Mike Levine. The reason I'm tuning in to listen to the show is he had Frank Edwards on, who was a well-known reporter had written some books on unusual phenomena of flying saucers, and I wanted to hear what Frank Edwards had to say. So I'm listening to the radio show, and inter interestingly, almost the entire program is focusing on this breaking news story 
of this brilliant fiery object that was seen from Ontario, Canada, over Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. Apparently, this object, whatever it was, moved in over the greater Pittsburgh area about 4.47 p.m. that afternoon. It's almost dark in Pittsburgh at the time, and there are multitudes of reports coming in from widespread areas to the, the Pittsburgh area radio, TV, newspapers, all the media sources, police departments. A lot of people thought an airplane had exploded in the sky. So there's a, I began to follow up on it that night. I began to write all the notes down I was getting from the broadcast. I'm running back and forth between the old black and white console TV and the radios listening to try to get updates. And in Pittsburgh, KDK TV was breaking in with live reports that evening that the military was now arriving in the Kecksburg area to search for an unidentified flying object. So Kecksburg is a little farming community about 40 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. So this object is seen over the greater Pittsburgh area. What's fascinating is as, as the evening goes on, this is the major news story on Pittsburgh area radio and TV. And it's being broadcast, and they're telling people this object reportedly saw in Westmoreland County, and hundreds of people descend on this little farming community to try to get a look at the object, which is down in the Wooded Ravine. So not only do you have civilians all over the place, but you have reporters there from all the major news agencies, radio, TV, newspapers. They become a part of the story because they either see or interact with some of the military on the scene. And now the interesting thing is, you know, of course, I was 16 years old. I wasn't even driving yet. I had no way to get out to the area. So I'm listening to all the news broadcasts that night. The next day, it's the headlines and most all the local papers. It made national news. AP, UP, I picked up the story. There was uh, our local paper, the Green Security Review, had two editions. The early morning edition had Army Ropes Off Area, Unidentified Flying Object Falls near Kecksburg. And it went on to say that something apparently fell in the woods. Nobody is being allowed anywhere near the object, that there was talk that it may have been contaminated with radiation, that they're awaiting the arrival of Army engineers and civilian scientists to examine whatever it may have been. And then the later edition has a number of different stories, including one that has searchers fail to find object. And it goes on to say that, yes, there was a search, but the authorities found absolutely nothing. They blamed it on. It was just imagination. And what people saw was a bright meteor in the sky, but nothing had fallen to the ground. And that is basically how officially it remains today. So I remember within days, and I'm just giving you a very abbreviated aspect of this right now, within days after it happened, there was talk all around that area that people saw a large military flatbed tractor trailer carrying a large tarped object out of the area late that night, which actually was early the next morning. Uh, and I can tell you that in the summer of 1990, before I did the Unsolved Mysteries uh, TV uh, premiere on this case, that um, a man contacted me, I checked his background out, and he didn't know that actually another person who was at the base had also confirmed the story, but he told me he was, he was a member of the Air Police, a security team that guarded the object when it came in from Pennsylvania to Lockbourne Air Force Base near Columbus, Ohio, during the early morning hours of December 10th. He said a flatbed tractor trailer, military flatbed tractor trailer with a tarp object, came into the base from an entrance they didn't normally use, back it into a hangar and set up a security perimeter around it, and they were given a shoot to kill order to anybody approach that hangar without the proper clearance. He told me he didn't stay on the team much longer, but he heard that the truck didn't stay there much longer, and it continued on to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base near Fairborn, Ohio. And then others later contacted me and told me exactly what building it went to at Wright-Patterson. So that's interesting. But anyhow, the interesting part of the story is this. You know, I spent years out in the field interviewing hundreds of people who were involved in the case that I was able to track down. Initially, there was very little information to go on. But over a period of weeks and months and years, I, I ran into people who were involved in the case. I got anonymous tips. I ran into people who had friends or neighbors or relatives who were involved. So now it's been hundreds of people I've interviewed. And I've learned so much, and there's still many unanswered questions, but I've learned a lot. And one thing I found out was that soon after this object fell, and whenever this object was, by the way, as it's moving in from Ohio to Pennsylvania, this thing is moving relatively slowly. 
It's making change in direction along its path. And those people saw it go down into the woods that afternoon said it did not come down at a high rate of speed. It did not come down, for example, like a meteor or reentry space debris. It came down almost like it made a controlled landing, and nobody ever saw any parachutes. And what we now know is that soon after it fell, some local people and then others came in, and they came across this large metallic acorn-shaped object semi-buried in the ground. Now, this thing is big enough for a man to move around inside of. They estimated one witness who was very close to it, he was a, a young volunteer fireman. He said this thing was probably 10 to 12 feet or more in length, but 8 to 10 feet in diameter. He had been a machinist all his life, and he said this thing looked like somebody took a liquid metal and poured it into an acorn-shaped mold. There's no rivet marks, no weld marks, no seams, no fuselage, no wings, no doors, no windows. But at the raised-up back of the object, like you have on an acorn, there were these unusual markings that he said look more like symbols than writing. And luckily, because of his background, he was somewhat familiar with Cyrillic or Russian, and he said that is definitely not what it was. So anyhow, we have eyewitnesses that saw the object on the ground. The military, once they got in, now, this happened again about 4.47 p.m., and this is a little farming community, like I said, about 40 miles southeast of Pittsburgh, and uh, it was very intriguing that the military began to arrive so quickly. So there are some witnesses who swear they began to see a, a minor military presence that could be a jeep running around the area looking for what this thing came down within an hour or so after it fell. Most of the military came in within a few hours, which is still relatively quickly. And that really wouldn't be that unusual, because you've got to remember, 1965 is Vietnam time, and there were many armories and military bases all over Pennsylvania and Ohio in the Pittsburgh area. So it would not be that unusual to have equipment and personnel that they can move pretty quickly. Indications were that whatever this thing was, it was probably being tracked, even though officially they claim it was not, it was all visual. Various sources over the years told me that it was indeed being tracked by radar, and that's how they were able to get the teams moving so quickly into the general area. We got more to say about Kecksburg and more. MIB. Lots of things with Gene and Chris. You're in the Barracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that too in Graphic Converter. Also print catalogs. Convert from so many formats i can't even list them download now to see if graphic converter is good for you like one and a half million other users guess what you could save money when you buy graphic converter use the coupon code night owl use the coupon code night owl to get a special price for graphic converter go to lemkesoft.com that's l-e-m-k-e soft.com lemkesoft.com l-e-m-k-e soft.com my name's Clyde, age 59, and I reside in Florence, South Carolina. The doctors diagnosed me as having clogged arteries. It felt like I was carrying heavy concrete blocks around my feet and legs. I started taking heart and body extract as directed. It is less than three weeks, and I'm like a young man again. It's unbelievable that an herbal formula can work so fast and so powerfully. Learn the secrets of an effective, natural, 100% organic nutritional supplement for a healthy heart and circulation at hbextract.com.
Are your Google search results killing you? Unflattering content in blogs, news articles, online reviews, social media, or other sources can jeopardize your reputation, your business, and your livelihood. Let Reputation.com help. Our patented technology will make the truth about you more visible while pushing down unwanted negative content. Improve your Google search results. Call Reputation.com at 1-800-831-0771 for a free consultation. That's 800-831-0771. Paid non-attorney spokesperson, Adam Pulaski of the Pulaski Law Firm with Principal Office in Houston, Texas, is the attorney responsible for the content of this ad. This ad is not legal advice, and the choice of a lawyer should not be based solely upon advertisement. Services may not be available in all states. Attention Zarelto users. If you or a loved one took Zarelto and suffered a serious bleeding event, you may be entitled to financial compensation. Zarelto is a popular prescription blood thinner used to prevent blood clots and protect patients from strokes. These serious bleeding events have led to numerous cases of hospitalization and even death. Phone lines are open 24-7. Call 800-261-0937. That's 800-261-0937. Paid non-attorney spokesperson, Ricky LeBlanc, admitted in Mass only. Sokolov Law, LLC, Chestnut Hill, Mass. Ken Levan, responsible attorney in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Greg Hobby, New Jersey. The choice of lawyer is an important decision that should not be based solely upon advertisements. While this firm maintains joint responsibility, most cases of this type are referred to other attorneys for principal responsibility. If you know what mesothelioma is, you or someone you love has likely been impacted by this devastating cancer. You may be entitled to compensation. Call Sokolov Law today. 1-800-218-HELP. The only known cause of mesothelioma is asbestos exposure. Thousands of hardworking men and women, including many U.S. veterans and industrial workers, have been diagnosed with mesothelioma because manufacturers knew the dangers but put profits ahead of people. An estimated $30 billion in court order trust has been set aside to pay money to asbestos victims. If you or a loved one has been diagnosed with mesothelioma, call now. You may be entitled to receive compensation without ever going to court or filing a lawsuit. Call for a free legal consultation at 1-800-218-HELP. That's 1-800-218-HELP. Okay, open your mouth and say, ah. Ah. When your child has a sore throat, you need to know when to get help. The doctor recommended Say Ah Sore Throat Exam is your solution. The scientifically designed oral retractor offers a clear view of the throat, relaxing the tongue and minimizing gag reflex. Compare with a medical grade chart, website, and app. Then you'll know just what to tell your doctor. A wellness plan in your hands in minutes. Go to sayahnow.com. Sayahnow.com, the new mainstay for every family's first aid kit. Hi, this is Tracy Torme, screenwriter, producer. You're listening to Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. He's bringing on his robotic voice. That's how they wanted aliens to speak in the 1950s, by the way. Chris has picked up that voice character perfectly. We have Stan Gordon. We have Astonishing Encounters. Stan, please continue. Okay, so anyhow, these people see this thing on the ground. Jim Romanski was the first eyewitness we actually found, and actually in 1987 as a result of a very large uh, UFO display I had at one of the local malls here. And uh, it wasn't until then that we actually had somebody actually saw the object on the ground. And Jim's story was really interesting. He was just, he was a young volunteer fireman, not from Kecksburg. He was from one of the local areas, one of the mutual fire departments, who had been called out to assist in the search for a possible downed aircraft in the Kecksburg area. And uh, he and a small group of other firemen came out and joined other firemen out of Kecksburg. They were going to search this large wooded area for a, what they thought was a downed aircraft. Anyhow, they had walkie-talkies with them. They were put in the trucks and left off at different locations along the perimeter of the woods to go up there and begin the search. And he said they weren't out very long when they got a radio call from one of the other teams that they came across the object. And Jim joined some of these other firemen on his little embankment, only a few feet away from this thing, was semi-buried in the ground. And they're looking at this thing, and they're realizing whatever this thing is, it was made by someone or something. It was no meteorite. And as they're standing there, two men in trench coats, really stern-looking men, come down through the woods and look at the object and look at them and start yelling, this area is now quarantined, you got to get out of here. We are talking about Jim Romanski, who was a young volunteer fireman, who uh, that day was down there with a search team, and uh, they came across the object, and while they were there, uh, the soldiers had come down through the woods, and they were told to get out of the woods. So he was the first eyewitness we had to the object on the ground. And then a year later, we got an anonymous tip that another local man had seen the object coming down, and he uh, went down into the woods, and he was probably 
probably the first or, or one of the first to actually see the object that was embedded down there in the Wooded Ravine. That was uh, Bill Bullybush. Since then, of course, we found other eyewitnesses and many other people around the area that saw the object uh, that was coming down that day. But there's one case, you are talking about the MIB, there was one thing that surfaced in more recent years. You know, even though this was now approaching the 50th year, year after year, including this year, because I, I do a lot of local events and speak at a lot of local uh, organizations, every once in a while I find some witnesses have come up to me with new information. And um, back in November of 2002, as you recall, the, the Sci-Fi Channel uh, was supporting a new group called the Coalition for Freedom of Information, and the head of that group was uh, Leslie Kane, the uh, journalist who was involved in very involved in UFO research, and they chose Kecksburg as their first case to investigate. So they put a lot of resources in, and they were able to get into certain areas and track down certain leads I couldn't. And, in fact, they located some of the Air Force personnel uh, who were on the scene that night at Kecksburg. That's another interesting story. Remind me to tell you about that, too. But anyhow, as all this is unfolding locally, and there's a lot of local news about this more intense investigation back at that time period, there was a whole list of new witnesses who were willing to talk with me. But there was one particular name, I'll call this man Joel, whose name had come to my attention, I believe it was about 13 years before at that time. I had called Joel at that time because I got a lead that he had been hiding down in the woods that day from the military and watching them as they're, they're loading the object onto the truck. And when I contacted him, he didn't deny it. He just said his family didn't want him involved, and he was afraid of getting in trouble with the government, and he didn't want to be involved. So now, years later, here's his name again. So I contacted him and made arrangements to go out and interview him as soon as I could. And when I went out there to interview him, the guy's an, an older fellow, retired fellow, and uh, when I got there, he was a little nervous, and he said, look, I was going to ch change my mind. My wife still didn't want me to talk about it, and I was just going to cancel this. Well, we sat down, and we got to know each other a little better, and I shared some basic information with him on the case, and he said, well, now that you're here, I'm about to tell you some of my story. And that went on to numerous other interviews, but anyhow, and, and we could talk for a long time. This was very extensive. But anyhow, the story was, to make it short, he had heard that the object had fallen down in that wooded area, that large wooded area where it fell. He, like many others, knew that area because they hunted down there. So he and his brother went out to the scene after hearing the news. He told his brother that he was going to go down the woods and see if he could find that thing, the object. He had a flashlight, but he didn't use it. And he told me that he found his way down to the site from what he looked like electrical arcing down in the woods, which other witnesses described to me as well. This thing was emitting like blue, and some others have some different, various colors of electrical arcing coming off the object itself. And he found his way down into that area, and he gave me some real specific information of how it was positioned and what he saw down there. And he goes on with the story that he was hiding down in the woods, and he kept moving back further into the woods, as people began to come in. And he said, first, they were civilians. And he said, they could have been volunteer firemen. He didn't know. But soon after they left, the military began to come in. And he said, I knew the military because I was in the service. He said he saw both Army and Air Force personnel. And his story gets stranger and stranger. It's a long story, too. But what he said to me was that there was, there was one person in particular, and apparently more than one, but one one fellow he kind of focused on, and he said, I didn't know if he was a politician. I guess he was a, a congressman or a senator, but he was some kind of politician. I said, what do you mean? He said, yeah. He said, that guy was down there. He had a camera, and he was dressed in a black suit with a black hat with a tie, and he was all dressed up down in the woods. He said, like, why would there be a, a politician down in the woods? And this guy was given orders to the military, and he was taking photographs of the, of the object. He called the object the hickey. He said, this guy took taking pictures of the hickey, of the trees that were damaged, that had been knocked down in the area. From where he was, he couldn't see well, but he said there were some tracks on the ground near the object. He said it looked almost like deer tracks, but he couldn't see that far away. And he said that that guy and others were very interested in those tracks, take a lot of pictures of them. And he said, I kind of had a, a 
feeling that something may have gotten out of that thing before I came. But we don't know. But then he did see something else that was very strange, and that gives us to a whole different perspective on Kecksburg now. And I don't know if you want to go into that part of it or not right now. Well, we, we have a, a bunch of questions, Dan. Uh, when you're on the show, it seems that uh, people come out of the woodwork because you're so, you've got so much interesting uh, you know, investigation and research work under your belt. Um, I've got one uh, question here that's very interesting, um, and there's a photograph of a very mysterious object that uh, they found on your site, Stan Gordon's UFO Anomaly Zone, and it appears to be uh, almost like a buoy shaped. It's pointed at both ends. It it's, appears to be uh, welded out of metal. Uh, if you're if you're on the Paracast forum, there's a very very good uh, photograph of it. What the heck is this thing, Stan? <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't know. It, it's still a mystery. After so many years, I got we. There was an incident happened in Hermony, Pennsylvania, Westmore County, back in June of 1980. A very credible family, and about 9:30 that night, the woman in this uh, rural home had to look out her back window and saw hovering behind her home in the trees uh, an object about the big as a car headlight, a bright object. And uh, a few minutes later, when she looked and went back in the window, it was gone. Roy didn't think much of it. The interesting thing is the next day, her husband, uh, up on that hill, discovers a strange metallic object sticking out of the ground on the hill behind the house. Now, this is a very secluded area. I mean, if you're going to hoax something, why wouldn't you put it in a place where people are going to see it? That's one thing. But anyhow, what they found out sticking out of the ground this thing, it looks like two large metallic cones welded together. It um, weighs around 20 pounds. It's about 21 inches long, and uh, it's very interesting. It's hollow inside. Uh, we have labs examine it, and we know what it's made of. It's made of mainly uh, nickel, chromium, and iron, so it's basically 100% stainless steel. The, the whole mystery is, like, why would anybody manufacture Why would they make it? And uh, the various labs have looked at it, and we know what it's made of, but nobody knows why it'd be made for any purpose, and why would it be found after a UFO incident? And um, it's one of a number of physical anomalies that I recovered uh, over the years. Um, another one, the first one we recovered, actually it was a number of, of samples, was back... Uh, 1972. Let's go into more of the things that you've recovered. We have Stan Gordon. The book is Astonishing Encounters. And it's astonishing we've remained connected this long. With Gene and Chris, you're in... The Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It just stopped responding. It took hours before it returned, but I'd already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Check it out. iWeb.com. That's iWeb.com. Don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. 1-855-905-MY-TV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. 
Say goodbye to the cable guy and get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 1-855-905-MY-TV. Sign up for packages starting as low as $19.99 and there's no equipment to buy. You get free HD TV upgrade, a free DVR upgrade, and free professional installation. You control what you watch when you watch it. Record your favorite shows, pause and rewind live TV, even skip the commercials. Watch local channels too. At just $19.99, what are you waiting for? Pull out your major credit or debit card. Call 1-855-905-MY-TV. 1-855-905-MY-TV. Say goodbye to the cable guy. Cut costs and get more. 1-855-905-MY-TV. 1-855-905-MY-TV. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. So we have Stan Gordon, author of Astonishing Encounters, going to tell us in a second more about the metallic thingies he's got. With Gene and Chris on the Paracast, we want to remind you to check out our new special offer for a lifetime membership of the Paracast Plus. To learn more, go to plus.theparacast.com, plus.theparacast.com. You get the ad-free version of this show. You get the exclusive After the Paracast podcast. More to come. We now have free offers, five-year memberships, lifetime memberships. Maybe we'll have eternal memberships next, plus.theparacast.com. So what kind of stuff have you over there, Stan Gordon? Well, you know, I was in this cone-shaped thing back in 1972. We were having a, a wave of UFO activity here in, around Westmoreland County, uh, outside of Pittsburgh, and uh, we were getting reports of formations of brilliant lights at night going across, and in some cases, people reporting some kind of metallic material that was falling from the, the lights as they went over. So our teams went out to some of these locations, and people were calling into us, and we were coming across this very unusual metallic material. For a better term, we call it space grass. And even John Keel mentioned about finding something similar back in the late 60s. It, it looks like thousands of, of, of these very thin strips of metal that are all interwoven together. We found these things uh, in the trees. We found it on the ground, interwoven into uh, clumps in some cases. And it's very interesting stuff. And once again, we had labs examine it. And it's basically 100% aluminum. Once again, the mystery is we had major companies look at it and examine it. Nobody knows why anybody would manufacture it or for what purpose. The closest thing would be a radar chaff, which our military would use to cause uh, interference to uh, radio communications, radar signals. This is not the same thing because your chaff disperses and this stuff comes down in clumps. So nobody really knows what this is all about. And if my memory serves me right, I believe going back many years ago, I think Linda and Moulton Howe had at least one case where some similar material was found in the mouth of one of the mutilated cows out in your direction there, Chris. Maybe you remember that. Yeah, that was on the Gomez Ranch, and it, it was radar chaff. They were able to ID it. What a cow was doing, eating it, and then ending up mutilated, that, that's a whole other story. <laughs> Yeah, I never saw it. I just remember talking about some kind of metallic material. I never heard what it actually was found. But I know I, I have actual radar chaff, and we can see the comparisons between the two, and this is not the same. And then another case that's really interesting was back in the late 60s in the Pittsburgh area, there was a very interesting UFO sighting. It was a big disc, as I recall. It was hovering in a very rural area above a field on beams of colored light, very low off the ground, a man happened to come by this war road and see this thing hovering in this big field. He went home several miles away and told his wife about it. She came back. It was still there. And he wanted to get out of the car and walk closer. And she was yelling at him not to get out of the car. And he opened the car door. The beams of light retracted and the object took off. The next day, however, he goes back to that location to see if there's any marks on the ground. And there's no marks. But here's this big metallic disc laying there. The disc has been in various labs. It's very interesting because it has some very interesting burnt holes through it and some very deep cuts, uh, those known as cavitation marks. So it's done under very high pressure. 
various metallurgists have examined it. Once again, it's 100 percent stainless steel. Nobody can figure out why it would be laying there in the middle of a field after a UFO incident and why anybody would manufacture it. So those are the couple, some of the physical anomalies that we've come up with over the years. Wow. Uh, there's not many uh, investigators out there, Stan, that has had the, uh, I guess, good fortune to have cases that actually leave behind, especially UFO cases that leave behind actual physical evidence that you can actually take and, and have tested. So what do you what do you do with all this stuff? Is it is you use it for paperweights or like door stops? Or? We have it in a safe area, and, and, <laughs> and I do a lot of public displays and shows. And in some cases over the years, I've I've had them out for the people to see. Yeah. A lot of like to give their input on what it might be, and sometimes you get other leads from it. So uh, it's interesting stuff, and it's a part of history. Boy, I'll say. You know, there's we have a, a number of questions here, as I mentioned before. And, you know, Han, who is one of our, Harry Newton, is one of our longtime posters. He's been, been here for um, uh, going on five and a half years. He's not sure if this is true, I think, uh, but he's wondering if you've uh, seen a decline in the popularity of Bigfoot. Uh, it just in general, uh, I, I've, I think it's the opposite. I think we've seen an actual a rise in interest uh, in Bigfoot because of all the uh, the Bigfoot shows uh, that, that have been on. But, but what do you think? Uh, do, do you see uh, a rise or a decline in popularity in the subject? And what do you think it is? Uh, you know, that's, a, of course, the, the million dollar question is, is this a flesh and blood crypto creature or are we dealing with something paranormal? Well, you know, I have to somewhat agree with you because at least from this area that I'm in, there's a huge interest in Bigfoot. It, it doesn't seem to go away. It seems to increase. In general, from the reaction I get from calls and people from around the country, that, yes, there's a huge interest in it, and there's no doubt that some of these reality shows are really uh, bring, bringing the subject to the attention of lots of people, and there seems to be a great interest in it. So I would say that the interest is continuing to increase with the Bigfoot phenomena. And I think it's gain, gaining more, um, you know, I think it's becoming more and more legitimate, I think, as a subject as well. I don't find people rolling their eyes as much as they used to when you mention Bigfoot. Of course, in areas like here in Arizona, we do have the Mogollon Monster that is reported from time to time. And But m most people that I talk to who are not that familiar with this subject, they don't realize that Bigfoot's been reported in 48 or 50 states. And that that's quite an eye-opener to them. But I'm seeing people are... I think more accepting of the potential reality of this phenomenon, and and they don't uh, roll their eyes and say, "Oh, that's you don't believe in that stuff, do you?" I, I don't know if you notice this, but I have. I, I think it's gaining more and more legitimacy as as the years go by. Oh, there's no doubt. In fact, coming up in a couple of weeks, we have the uh, and again back to Fayette County. There's a a group down there, an organization, and they're sponsoring. It's called Project Talent in Clondersville, PA, and on October seventeenth. They're sponsoring the first Fayette County UFO Bigfoot Paranormal Expo. It's going to be all day long. And I'll be speaking there, and we'll be uh, showing uh, a couple movies and having speakers on these subjects all day long. As we've seen at other local events, quite often a lot of witnesses like to come down there and talk to you. A lot of them do it confidentially. Yeah. But glad to hear that other people have shared uh, their experiences. Yeah, I think conferences, uh, especially small uh, regional and local conferences, that's where you really come up with some of your best cases. I did a, um, a small conference in Angel Fire, uh, New Mexico, just south of Taos there. And one of my best cases uh, in recent years showed up out of the blue and invited me back over to the ranch and just blew, blew my socks off uh, with the story uh, and a whole series of events that had occurred. And this was all because of a, of a small regional uh, conference. I think it's a great place for investigators and folks out there, uh, you know, take note if you have this type of event in your area, um, make yourself available for people and get out there in the field, get out of your armchairs, get out there in the field, become the Stan Gordon in your neighborhood and, and uh, you know, spend the time, you know, chase, chase these leads down, make the phone calls, network with people. You know, Stan I, is just, has always been a major, I just have looked up to this guy for so many years and, and he's been an inspiration for me. And so let him be an inspiration for you too. I, you know, this, this is a, not easy work, but it can be very rewarding. At the very least, it can blow your mind. <laughs> and, you know, something, uh, Chris, that's been brought up over the years, you know, we're talking about Bigfoot. I wrote my solid invasion book a few years ago because I felt and so many people asked me that they thought I need to write it. They knew about the research I did and it was so important. 
and I was a little reluctant to because it got into such strange aspects of Bigfoot, but I've had nothing but an extremely positive reaction from around the country and even out of the country about the book because, again, and we didn't get a chance to even talk about it today, but, you know, there were those cases that suggested highly that at least some of the Bigfoot accounts appear to be something other than a flesh and blood animal. The more cryptid reports I get, and there's some in the, in the new Astonishing Encounters book, the more it suggests that in some cases we're dealing with something that seems to come into our physical reality, can leave physical evidence, and then it's gone. This segment is gone. With Gene and Chris, you're in The Paracast. <laughs> Neighbors, are you tired of dealing with a slow web hosting provider? Well, check out A2 Hosting and their screaming fast Swift server platform. They even have SSDs that load pages 300% faster than the competition. Ready to give your site a speed boost? Well, tell you what, neighbors, head on over to a2hosting.com. That's A2, that's number two, a2hosting.com. Check out their Prime Hosting account. And get this, neighbors, they're even giving you an exclusive 25% off discount for all our listeners. 25%. And remember, their Guru Crew support team is standing by 24-7, 365 days a year to answer any of your questions. Now, to get the discount, use the coupon code GENE when you check out. Hi, this is Walt Augustinowitz. I'm the founder and CEO of ID Stronghold. By now, you've heard our commercials about wallets that protect you from electronic pickpocketing. Ten years ago, I created a way to protect my own cards from prying eyes after government officials started talking about issuing a national ID card with a built-in radio chip called RFID. I felt having to broadcast my personal information was an invasion of privacy. Soon after, it was also announced that credit cards, debit cards, U.S. passports, hotel room keys, and even transit passes would all soon incorporate RFID. It was then I formed ID Stronghold to share my inventions in blocking RFID signals with the world. There are a lot of misconceptions out there today about RFID. I encourage everyone to get informed and get protected. Please go to IDStronghold.com and get the facts and the wallet sleeves or badge holders you need to protect your personal financial data. You'll be pleasantly surprised that through our direct sales model, you won't pay more than other comparable unprotected wallets. It is as though the protection is free. Visit IDStronghold.com today. Hi, I'm Rick Osick with Famous Footwear. Did you know that premature birth is the number one killer of babies? That's why we support the March of Dimes in the fight against premature birth. Join us in supporting cutting edge research, treatment programs, and outreach to help moms have full term pregnancies and healthy babies. Learn how you can help save babies' lives at marchofdimes.org. What would your life be like if you woke up each morning with new vitality, feeling better than you have in years, and you noticed a difference in your sleeping patterns, blood sugar levels, and had a sense of well-being overall? There's something that is changing thousands of people's lives, and you could be one of them. It's called Heart and Body Extract. Sharon Harris, co-creator of Heart and Body Extract, talks about the positive effects of Heart and Body Extract. What happens with the formula Heart and Body Extract is it's giving the body the necessary vitamins, minerals, amino acids, enzymes, and phytonutrients so, so the body will heal itself. And yes, the body does have the ability to balance blood pressure, balance cholesterol, clean and unclog the arteries. It can also work on uh, balancing the circulation for diabetics. So the body is an amazing thing. It simply needs some help so it has the tools to heal itself. Heart and body extract gets results. To order your two-month supply, call now, toll-free at 866-295-5305. Order online at hbextract.com. Okay, open your mouth and say, ah. Ah. When your child has a sore throat, you need to know when to get help. The doctor recommended Say Ah Sore Throat Exam is your solution. The scientifically designed oral retractor offers a clear view of the throat, relaxing the tongue and minimizing gag reflex. Compare with a medical grade chart, website, and app. Then you'll know just what to tell your doctor. A wellness plan in your hands in minutes. Go to sayahnow.com. Sayahnow.com, the new mainstay for every family's first aid kit. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. 
That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. It's amazing that Chris has actually remained connected on Skype for yeah. 10 minutes or so now. Wow. We're setting a record here for today's show. Right. Now, which ISP are you using? We should mention this in case other people are considering that. Well, it's Suddenlink. And, and like I mentioned to you during one of our down periods here, the three-town area around me was completely down two days ago for an entire day. And I've just upgraded to twice my um, upload and download speeds. And you would think that I would be getting, uh, you know, have a little bit more consistent, uh, consistent service here. But, you know, we'll, we'll get to the bottom of it. Too bad you don't have a viable competitor. You're telling us that we have, of course, CenturyLink serving your area. And having used CenturyLink in the past, I know it's hit or miss. Yeah. That's the problem here in the U.S., of course. Most of our listeners in the United States have but one option for broadband yeah. internet. Just one. Yeah. And that's not fun. Let's get back to the questions and the comments, Chris. Yeah, we do. We have a good question here from Steve C., who's been a member of our forum at forum.theparacast.com since 2011. This is the question bank where our listeners can ask questions of our, our guests. And uh, today is one of my favorite guests that we have on from time to time, Stan Gordon. Stan, if it turns out through, dis through disclosure uh, that Kecksburg was nothing more than a satellite plane part of Monday in explanation, would you be relieved or disappointed? I think we can pretty much factor out uh, based on your description of witnesses, uh, eyewitness reports that this thing was, it came down under control. So it doesn't sound like a plane part or I know people have said over the years that it was a Russian satellite that we got. And it doesn't really sound like any of those things. Um, do you think it was a bona fide UFO or do you think it was something else? Well, you know, after I, I keep an open mind to all possibilities and, and I hope someday that I'm still living, that we can have closure on the case and we have positive proof once and all as to what the object was itself. There still is many, many mysteries in this case, and we didn't even get into some of the interesting aspects of the case, which, again, in more recent years, there is more indication of the possibility that something may have been inside of the object. So that's a fascinating aspect as well. But over the years, there were a number of different people who contacted me and told me they knew for sure what the object was. And everybody had a different story. It just goes back <laughs> to the time of the incident occurring. One of the first accounts we heard was from a witness who had been interviewed by an Air Force officer who told me that Air Force officer told her that it was a Gemini capsule that had been expelled in the area. Well, we found out, of course, that wasn't the case. Yes. Another man told me he knew certain that it was a projectile fired from a giant gun from a railroad car in Canada. We interviewed him, and all the specifics he gave us definitely did not fit. Another man told me he knew for sure it was a Soviet ICBM that went out of control. Another one said it was a missile. And, of course, we looked in the Cosmos 96, that Soviet Venus probe, that was a suspect for years because, coincidentally, it reentered the Earth's atmosphere over Canada about 3.18 a.m. in the morning on the same day. This happened about 4.47 in the afternoon. Just to make the story short, in more recent years, there's been an, enough data that's come out which probably pretty much eliminates Cosmos 96 as being the culprit. I would say after all these years that my best guess is that we're either dealing with some very secretive, some very advanced man-made space probe that has some type of reentry capability, or we're dealing with something that's extraterrestrial or interdimensional or something else along that line. Right. you got to remember, it was the early days of the space program. And, and I talked to many people who worked for NASA at the time, engineers and scientists, who designed a lot of the projects for that time period. And when they look at Kecksburg, they all scratch their head and pretty much say, well, we didn't have anything similar to that. Again, I keep an open mind to all possibilities. I hope someday we do have closure on the case. Okay, um, enough said on Kecksburg. Here's a question from Dave M., who was one of our longest uh, posters at forum.thepaircast.com. He's been posting for uh, almost eight years now. Stan, are you familiar with David Polides? If so, what are your thoughts about his Bigfoot slash miss Missing Persons books, and are the two connected? 
Yeah, I, I, I am familiar with him. I can't say I've read all of the books. I, I've heard of some of the cases. I think he's got some really interesting material out there. I understand that he might be associating some of the disappearances with Bigfoot. It, that's my understanding. I, I can't really comment on it because I don't know all the details. I can tell you that of the hundreds of Bigfoot cases I've looked into over the years, I've really never seen any indication of these things were really harmful to humans, let's say. There were cases where people told me these things wanted to hurt them. It e they easily could have under the circumstance. These things have great agility. They move very fast. I've had some cases where they've chased cars up to 50 miles an hour for a short distance over the years. I had reports that I'm carrying, running and carrying deer, deer over shoulders. I have not had any cases that I'm aware of and I can think of where there may have been a, a, a person missing and connected with a Bigfoot case, but, of course, I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything that's going on out there, so I keep an open mind to all possibilities. <laughs> I love the case from Silent Invasion with the scratches on the back of the car. <laughs> that's a classic. Yeah, actually, it's in the other book. It's Really Mysterious Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. Oh, the, okay. The last book that came out. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, that's a really the photographs, they're, they're pretty yeah. impressive. And, and that may have involved, possibly have involved a government agency as well. It just never stops. Here's a, a question from Specter73, who's been a poster for uh, just a couple of years now, and uh, actually a couple of months. And uh, he wants to know, kind of, it's more of a general question about your thinking. Have your personal views, theories on the many topics that you invest have investigated over the years changed? And if so, do you think that there's a trend being influenced by or the popular culture or is influencing popular culture? First of all, have your uh, thoughts and uh, conclusions uh, sort of morphed over the years or, or become more solid – and do you think that we're seeing uh, the culture influencing thinking about these subjects, or do you think uh, the, the actual events are influencing the culture? Well, to me personally, I don't think that I've been influenced by the media or the culture, what I've seen. Basically, I'm influenced by the interviews I do with witnesses, the patterns I've seen, the evidence I've uncovered over the years. And yes, things have changed. You know, when I got into this back so many years ago, uh, as I said, I thought Bigfoot was very likely an unknown primate, and I thought that a lot of these unexplained UFO sightings were probably extraterrestrial. The more I'm involved in this and the many years I've spent out in the field and the more inter witnesses I've interviewed, the more I'm convinced that there's a lot more of this than we understand, and it may be much more mysterious than, we, than any of us really realize. And I said years ago, the phenomenon is so strange it protects itself. Because who in the heck is going to believe it? As I look into some of these UFO cases over the years, you know, they range from lights in the sky and formation of lights to very large, solid objects, what appear to be constructed devices. Let's go on with more UFO lore from Stan Gordon. The book is Astonishing Encounters. I have the astonishing Chris O'Brien with me, and he's going to have an astonishing stinger. You're in the Paracast. You are listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Are your Google search results killing you? Unflattering content in blogs, news articles, online reviews, social media, or other sources can jeopardize your reputation, your business, and your livelihood. Let Reputation.com help. Our patented technology will make the truth about you more visible while pushing down unwanted negative content. Improve your Google search results. Call Reputation.com at 1-800-831-0771 for a free consultation. That's 800-831-0771. Okay, open your mouth and say, ah. Ah. When your child has a sore throat, you need to know when to get help. The doctor recommended Say Ah Sore Throat Exam is your solution. The scientifically designed oral retractor offers a clear view of the throat, relaxing the tongue and minimizing gag reflex. Compare with a medical grade chart, website, and app. Then you'll know just what to tell your doctor. A wellness plan in your hands in minutes. Go to sayahahnow.com. Sayahnow.com, the new mainstay for every family's first aid kit. Hi, Peter Vaccaro for ParanormalDate.com. Are you looking for love in all the wrong places? 
Now you have a chance to change that by signing up for free at ParanormalDate.com. This incredible dating site puts people of like minds together. People who are interested in the strange, the unusual, mysteries, ghosts, UFOs, and the afterlife, and so much more. ParanormalDate.com was developed for you, people seeking a viable alternative to the other dating services. You can join for free by going to ParanormalDate.com, and if you decide you like it and want to connect with people, use the code GEORGE for a substantial discount. Mark Rawlings, president of ParanormalDate.com, says so many people hunger to share their experiences about the paranormal, the unexplainable, or the afterlife, and so much more, and this is the source for them to meet and share that common interest. So sign up for free at ParanormalDate.com, ParanormalDate.com, and use the code GEORGE if you decide to connect with someone you like. Paid non-attorney spokesperson Adam Pulaski of the Pulaski Law Firm with principal office in Houston, Texas is the attorney responsible for the content of this ad. This ad is not legal advice and the choice of a lawyer should not be based solely upon advertisement. Services may not be available in all states. Attention Zarelto users. If you or a loved one took Zarelto and suffered a serious bleeding event, you may be entitled to financial compensation. Zarelto is a popular prescription blood thinner used to prevent blood clots and protect patients from strokes. These serious bleeding events have led to numerous cases of hospitalization and even death. Phone lines are open 24-7. Call 800-261-0937. That's 800-261-0937. You pick up the receiver with your heart racing and sweat dripping from your forehead. You finally muster the courage to dial the number to call into your favorite talk radio show. It rings once, twice, and then... Hello, it's GCN. What's your name and the state you're calling from? Surprised you got through, you squeak out. Jason from Minnesota. Please hold. As you patiently wait for your turn, you begin to daydream about being a famous talk radio host and what it would be like to have your own show. Jason from Minnesota, you're up. Millions of loyal listeners worldwide waiting to call and talk to you. Caller, are you there? Cheering crowds surround you, calling out your name. Going once, twice. Okay, we gotta move on to the next caller. You blew it. Huh? Wait, no! Interact with the host you're listening to right now online at GCNlive.com. Click on the community link. Engage with other listeners. Ask questions. Start debates. Don't agree with the host? Let them know. Be a part of the community at GCNlive.com. We use mobile devices right against our bodies every day. But growing scientific evidence has emerged showing serious health risks associated with exposure to EMF radiation emitted from these devices. The solution is Defender Shield, the most effective mobile radiation shielding ever developed. Defender Shield blocks virtually 100% of EMF radiation from cell phones, tablets, and laptops and starts at just $64.99. Buy now at DefenderShield.com. For 10% off, use promo code GCN. DefenderShield.com, the worldwide leader in mobile radiation shielding. My name is Richard Dolan. You're listening to the Paracast. Astonishing? Mm. I don't know. Stan Gordon's with us. Let me ask you, Stan, have you seen the types of UFOs that are seen change over the years? Yeah, what I was referring to is the fact that, you know, there have been reports of these large triangular objects, cigar-shaped objects, your typical disc. And in more recent years, we're getting more reports of these very large, solid, sometimes black, even seen in daylight, these huge rectangular objects as well. And, you know, you asked me earlier in the show you know, about um, we don't very often hear about what I call the classic UFOs, these large objects seen close to the ground. Do we used to hear about them in the 50s and 60s and 70s, but they still go on. I mean, as, re- as recent as the last few weeks, I've had at least uh, a couple of interesting cases. But one case that stands out that I think was a really interesting case I investigated was June 1st of 2013. So it wasn't that long ago. This was um, in North Huntington Ch- Township, a suburb of Pittsburgh, on a major highway, Route 30, four-lane highway. The case involved a woman who was well-educated, did not believe in UFOs until that night, and her three-year-old, three-year-old child, they were uh, coming out of a convenience store a little after 10 o'clock that night, making a left, and they were heading on Route 30 eastbound towards little village Adamsburg, when suddenly she had to slow down almost stop in the middle of Route 30. Luckily, she was in any car around at the time, but she was hoping there was others around to see it. Well, what she saw, the reason she slowed down was about 60 feet above the highway, it's this huge, maybe 55-foot-long, 
solid metallic rectangular object just hovering there. It's taken up all four lanes of the highway. The lighting on it, the navigational lighting, was nothing like normal aircraft. It was completely silent. Her three-year-old baby yells, Mommy, flying iPad in the sky. And uh, the woman is on her cell phone at the time talking to a friend, and she's describing what she's seeing. And as she passes underneath the object, she loses her cell phone signal. All the electronics in the dash of her car goes out, such as the FM radio goes off the air. And uh, she tries to take a picture with her iPhone, and it wouldn't let her go to the photo mode. But as she moves down the road, everything comes back on. Well, that's a classic uh, type case with a new wrinkle, the classic electromagnetic interference type of thing. Exactly, exactly. And she told me, now, the car she had at the time was not that old, and I just saw her a few months ago, and she told me her car has never worked properly since that night. So those are the kind of cases that are really intriguing, and uh, that woman now believes in UFOs, by the way. <laughs> sure. I wonder well, why. Well, speak, speaking of uh, objects seen in the sky, one thing that I've always marveled at about Pennsylvania reports is the amazing giant bird sightings and, and you know, strange uh, flying creature sightings. Um, over the years, you've, I mean, the bewildering array of these types of reports that you've uh, gone out on over the years is is really, I mean, dazzling to me. And what are some of your favorite cases and some of the, the, the more bizarre cases of these giant flying uh, animals, birds, uh, mothmen? I mean, there's various descriptions of, of them because there's so many different types. Why don't you yeah, give us kind of a sense of that? Yeah, there's, um, well, there's a number of them in, in the new Astonishing Encounters book, and I've had actually... Uh, in the last couple of weeks, I've had at least one recent report come in. One, I had to interview another person from Buenos Aires something about two months ago, and I know that there's some other researchers out there have been hearing other reports from around Pennsylvania as well. Probably one of my favorites is actually one that happened uh, at neighboring West Virginia back in uh, 2000, I believe it was around 2000, fall of 2007, outside of Clendenin, West Virginia. And I interviewed the fellow several times. He sent me a sketch of what this thing looked like. Anyhow, he's riding down a road. It's a two-lane rural road about 8 o'clock in the morning, so it's daylight. And he has to hit his brakes real hard because here's this giant bird blocking the road with dead, with a dead animal in his mouth, so it's eating roadkill. And he said he's startled by the size of this thing because it's, it's at least four feet tall. The head of it is extending above the roof line of his car. And he gave me a very detailed description. He said, like many other people, these things are generally dark brown or black in color. It had dark feathers. The neck was long and crook. The beak appeared to be dark. It was very large and long. The eyes were dark in color. But he said what really stood out was those wings, the wingspan. And he said he watched this thing. It's jumping and hopping back and forth in an awkward manner, like it's trying to get off the ground. It's flapping its wings. And as it was flapping its wings, he said he could see the wingtips hitting at the edge of each side of the road and it's gravel and dirt going up as it was flapping its wings. And finally, it got up in the air and went up over the trees. He went back the next day to measure the wingspan because he saw exactly where the ends of the wingtips were. It was 21 feet across. Wow, oh, that's twice as big as a condor, which has the largest wingspan, I think, uh, in nature. So, yeah, it, it's one of the many, many cases. Now, you know, as you mentioned, while I, we put them under the category of Thunderbirds, some of these look like just very oversized giant birds. In other cases, people have described seeing something with more of a leather-like skin rather than feathers, more like a giant bats. In some cases, people are giving me a really detailed account and they're describing something very reluctantly that looks prehistoric like a pterodactyl or a pteratorn. Some people have said these things look like gargoyles. So there are similarities in the reports and yet differences as well. Wow. Yeah, what astounds me is the the variety of descriptions that you find in Pennsylvania. Um, most other areas don't really have the, the uh, you know, bewildering different types of, of flying creatures that like Stan is describing. It, it, they're more... Like either they're pterodactyl-looking things or they're giant birds. 
you rarely have uh, reports from a you know from a, a region like that where you have a whole a whole slew of different descriptions like that. Uh, that's always been intriguing to me. What do you make of these giant bird sightings? I mean, shouldn't more people be seeing these things and reporting them if they're actually physical flesh and blood creatures? Well, you know, the whole thing is just like with UFO sightings. And, and you know, I talk about this with witnesses and people all the time. And if you're just walking down the street, look at people. What are they doing? They're texting or talking on their phone. People rarely look up in the sky. So, you know, if you're not looking up, you're not going to see that there may be something out there. And I, I think more and more people have seen these things from what I get from a lot of friends of people and relatives of people. And I've talked to people who are very reluctant to even tell me about what they saw because they can't believe they saw what they saw. So I, I think these things are going on probably much more that people are either reluctant to report it or they don't know where to report it to. Yeah, it's like who, who's who's going to believe you is the first thing that probably goes through your mind, and and then second is you know you, you're even worried about telling your family or friends. I'm I'm I'm, I'm not surprised that uh, you know people aren't seeing these things actually because they're falling in love with their damn thumbs. I yeah, think we're and gonna... we uh, yeah, luckily on occasion it's more with UFOs, but on occasion. We are lucky if somebody does get some videos or uh, some still photographs. And, you know, unfortunately, these digital cameras are not designed, especially at night, to try to focus on an image far away. So you get a lot of false images, especially with electronics and digital cameras. But uh, on occasion, we get something interesting that uh, does come in. Now, I should tell yeah. everybody, if they listen to our other show, The Tech Night Out Live, Apple came out with new iPhones this past week, the iPhone 6S and the iPhone 6S Plus. Both can take 4K video. In addition to everything else, they have improved cameras. But as Stan says, you know, for shooting something at night from a distance, none of these cameras can do it. At best, maybe you'll get a video of some vague flickering light in the sky. And do we really need any more vague flickering lights in the sky? Isn't that vague enough? Well, forgive the puns in any case, but you get the point here. These shooters that are built into these smartphones, they do good stuff, but they don't work under those circumstances very well. It's just the way it is. We got one more segment to spend with our friend Stan Gordon, author of Astonishing Encounters. More to come with Gene and Chris. You're in The Paracast. <laughs> Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that too in Graphic Converter. Also print catalogs. Convert from so many formats i can't even list them download now to see if graphic converter is good for you like one and a half million other users guess what you could save money when you buy graphic converter use the coupon code night owl use the coupon code night owl to get a special price for graphic converter go to lemkesoft.com that's l-e-m-k-e soft.com lemkesoft.com l-e-m-k-e soft.com Silver has always been nature's very own antibiotic, and only one system allows you to produce an endless supply of nano-sized silver solutions right from the convenience of your home. Silver Lungs. With the addition of our unique lung delivery system, respiratory infections are targeted directly, where traditional oral administration simply cannot reach. This pioneering method also preserves the original particle sizes and delivers your silver solution directly into the bloodstream. See the Silver Lungs generator and lung delivery system at silverlungs.com. That's silverlungs.com. Hey, Berkey Guy here. Are you still drinking unfiltered tap water? Does your water contain chlorine or fluoride? Will you have drinkable water in an emergency? The Berkey Guy is here to help you remove these and other potential contaminants from your water, thus helping you drink clean, purified water. We offer Berkey water purification systems at the lowest available prices online. Don't go another moment without Berkey System. Over the last 10 years, we've helped thousands drink clean, purified water. Join them by visiting GoBerkey.com or call me, the Berkey Guy, at 877-886-3653. That's 877-886-3653. 
Owe $10,000 or more to the IRS? Get on board with the tax admiral. Don't pick on the IRS alone. I'll cut penalties and reduce your overall tax bill. Sometimes I can even get it zeroed out completely. We're an A-rated company helping people clean up their mess with the IRS. If you owe $10,000 or more, then call the tax admiral. Call 800-287-7180. Again, that's 800-287-7180. 800-287-7180. Are you tired of commuting to a job that makes someone else rich, working harder than ever, but getting nowhere? Do you hate spending hundreds of dollars every week on daycare, having someone else raise your children? With our opportunities, you can start earning money as soon as next week. You get to be the boss, work from home, and live a happier life. At Be The Boss Network, you'll find hundreds of work-from-home opportunities that you can literally start today and be earning money as soon as next week. Go to freedom106.com and start earning money as soon as next week. You get to be the boss. Get out of the rat race. Work from home. Go to freedom106.com right now and change your life today. That's freedom, the number 106.com. Go to freedom106.com and start earning money as soon as next week. You be the boss. Go to freedom106.com. If you're like me, you're concerned about the stock market and the economy. You're asking the questions, but it just doesn't seem that you're getting the right answers. Well, my friends at the Wealth Preservation Institute not only have the answers, but they've put together a free report, How to Survive the Upcoming Economic Collapse and Protect Your 401Ks, IRA Savings, and Retirement Income. Don't hesitate. This report's for free for a limited time by calling 888-772-2929. That's 888-772-2929. Take back your financial lives today. This is Jerome Clark, author of the UFO Encyclopedia and other books. You're listening to the Paracast. So this is a quick session, despite the interruptions with the loss of reception, because Skype decided they don't like Chris. Maybe because he's using Macs and Skype is owned by Microsoft. Now, that doesn't work. I have a Mac and I'm using Skype and there's no disconnection. I shouldn't say anything because I will be challenging the gods. We don't want that to happen. I think it's a Mac man in black. We are the Mac men in black. Apple's protectors. That's a bad song or something. I don't sing. Except for my supper. And these days, you know, I'm not getting too much supper. So there you go. (laughs) So start singing. (laughs) <laughs> well, no, you don't want to do that because we will lose every single listener to this show if I made the slightest effort. Stan Gordon, we have just a few moments left. Let's cover a few things here. And you've accumulated a vast repository of files here. Strange creatures, dragons, winged humanoids, UFO cases, metallic fragments, Bigfoot, whatever. What's the next step? Where do we take all this information to figure out what's going on? Well, you know, <laughs> I've been doing it for a long time, and, and, and I'm hoping, I'm, luckily at some of the events, I'm meeting some very young, very educated uh, next generation, hopefully new investigators, who hopefully they'll be able to continue on where we won't be able to, and hopefully they'll be able to cover, uh, uncover some of these answers, because these mysteries are going to continue long uh, past the time when... Uh, I'm no longer here, and probably none of us will be here. Does that feel frustrating to you, though, that you could spend so many years since you're a teenager? And I understand that because that's when I started. That's when Chris got started with exploring the paranormal. Do you feel at all frustrated or jaded that the answer may not come in your lifetime? Oh, not really. You know, it's been such an interesting journey, and I've I've learned so many new things, and I've learned about beings and creatures and entities and things that I never would have believed could ever exist until you start talking to so many different people from so many backgrounds from some such far-reaching areas. They tell you similar accounts and they give you those little details and you find those strange footprints out there. There's just so many things that we've learned and yet there's so many answers that we still don't have. But it, it's made me aware that, you know, there's so much more to our world that, uh, 
God's given us a lot of anomalies to deal with out there, and there's a lot of things we just don't have the answers for. Yeah, and also helping people. Um, sometimes these events, you know, they not only can they be frightening and, and actually put people into a state of terror, but they also have a have a way of, of completely shattering your reality view at times, it, uh, completely turning what you thought was a, you know, normal three-dimensional reality upside down. Who are you going to talk to about that sort of thing? I constantly was finding myself helping people work their way through these just inexplicable experiences. And Stan, too, I can tell you've got a very, very good manner. Uh, You've interviewed thousands and thousands of people. And when somebody comes to you and says, look, I had this really bizarre thing happen. You know, know, I I can't sleep at night. Um, You know, my my family says I'm, I'm on edge, you know, and, and you just can't help but feel, feel for these people. And, you know, in my in my particular work, I, I had to you know deal with a lot of ranchers who were missing livestock, and you know I had big burly ranchers cry on my shoulder and say, "Why did they take my best breeding cow?" And I think it's the helping people part of it that that kind of kept me going forward. Now yeah. that I'm sort of taking a back seat a little bit to it, uh, I I, I kind of miss that actually. How about you? I mean, do you find yourself uh, being like a paranormal shrink at, at times? Well, I wouldn't call it a shriek, but yes, there's no doubt I deal with that all the time. I'm on a regular, quite regular basis. I deal with people all the time that come to me. We have long discussions, we, and we make them aware that they're not the only ones. It's something, it, it's kind of a support for them to make them aware that they're not the only ones that have had, had these encounters. And most of the time, most of them are so very happy to learn that what they saw was also seen by others, that they weren't alone. And they generally feel a lot better after we have discussions. Yeah, that's important too. I guess there's uh, people feel more comfortable if you know they weren't the only ones singled out. That that can be, uh, I think, disconcerting for some people. And it, it's good for them to know that they're not the only ones, and they're not crazy. I mean, I've, I'm sure you've had people say, "I think uh, you know, I thought I was going crazy. Uh, I could not explain what I saw, and I, I was really starting to question my own sanity." Thank God somebody else saw it too, you know. I, I mean, I've heard that you know, more than a few times, as I'm sure you have. Over the years, many witnesses, especially those that have had some really close sightings, one of the first things they say to me always is, first of all, don't use my name. And second thing is, I don't want you to think I'm crazy because I know what I saw. And I hear that all the time. Yeah, it's almost predictable in, in a lot of cases. Do you find that people in these areas, uh, like along the Chestnut Ridge and in Fayette County, Bucks County, do you find 